Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this Friday afternoon Sunset Drive. And you're with me, Alex here in Okakuyo. And unfortunately, it's a little bit quiet, but we do have our Egyptian Goose family right here. And we'll take a little look at them, see what is going on. We've had a number of Springbok here throughout the course of the day. Lovely European beaters calling as well. And nice to see that the six goslings are still with this Egyptian goose pair. You should just be able to make them out for those little blobs just in front of the two adults over there. But really nice audio with the European bee eaters. No complaints with them. They really are very endearing birds. Very pretty as well. Tough to show, of course, but uh, nice to hear them anyway. Some blacksmith lapwings, a couple of southern mast weavers as well calling. And a rather peaceful start. So nice to see the Egyptian goose family. They have been with us, of course, for the entirety of the day. And nice to know that. All six goslings are still around, as I said. So we are going to be keeping tabs on them just to make sure we know the numbers and, of course, hoping that they all then do fledge in the next two months. So nice just to see. I'm going to just zoom out again. Hopefully we can pick up on some of the springbuck that have been around. There's one or two of them in the distance over here. Of course, a lovely green flush that is also now present here in Okakuyo. So as I said, I'm just going to be zooming out. Nice to listen to and pick up that bird vocal right now. That would be European bee eaters. And we've got our first springbok coming down to the water at the moment. We've got three of them in the frame right now. So I'm going to try to get a bit closer. Of course, the light is a bit harsh with it being almost kind of midday-ish, really, for Okakuyo. But uh, talking of the weather and what it's doing at the moment, let us take a look and see what is going on across the different locations this afternoon. Good afternoon, a good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the deck here from Jackie's Tree Lodge up in the Mendique Game Reserve where it is a sweltering temperature, 33 degrees Celsius out there. The elephants have come down to drink. Hello everybody, my name is Steve and I'm joined by Rian on camera and we are out and about, well, hiding underneath the shelter of this roof. And we are excited to be able to show you some animals coming down to the water hole this afternoon. So let's see if we can get another view of those elephants before they disappear. I just dropped my phone on the floor there. It's my connection to the communication, so I apologize for that. If you heard a very loud banging sound. So it is warm. It's a great day to hang around water and there is another herd of elephants coming which is quite nice. It's probably the third herd we've seen in about 10 minutes. Decks like this at Jackie's Sabi, or should I say Jackie's Tree Lodge and Jackie's Safari Lodge up here in Medique provide amazing viewing for the decks uh, for the guests they can come and just chill out here deck chairs breakfasts are often set up here lunches sometimes candlelight dinners very special moments all sorts can come down to drink but what is expected at this time of day most certainly 
the largest of them all. Mm, Roxy, it, nothing better than starting the afternoon off with the gentle giants. And you'll see how excited they get when they get to the last little bit of space. They have been working up a sweat, or well, not really, but they've been working up some energy to get here. Last little bit, suddenly you'll see the excitement in the little ones. They've been anticipating this moment for some time. And hopefully they don't go behind the bush there. That would just be rude. Well, it is a live and interactive safari. And if they do go behind the bush, well, that is really up to them. See, now the female has decided to choose to go a little bit more to the left-hand side. Thank you for that. And her youngster will follow suit. You might hear some creaking and groaning. It's just the sun beating down on the roof and the heat causing it to shrink and expand. But lots of birds as well. Weaver colonies, Egyptian geese. One of the benefits of being out here on safari is these water holes around the camps that you don't always need to go out and about into the wild to go and see animals as many times they'll come and see you. So you can sit here with your favorite book, your favorite beverage, to soak up the scenes. William, do elephants know or recognize new elephants? I'm pretty sure they do. Their sense of smell is incredible. They're very good at smelling. And I think they also have a very good sense of determining individuals by sight as well, because sometimes they, they sort of pick up on an individual and they look at them and they know who it is. But I think their smell is the absolute key behind it all. And elephants will often walk up to each other and put their trunks into each other's mouths if they've, they know each other for some time and possibly haven't seen each other. And that reestablishes a bond. It possibly gives them a memory of, of where they've been. And if they don't know the animal, they might be quite tentative. Elephant bulls, though, are quite, are quite good at interacting with new individuals, quite good at walking up and sort of just being submissive and going, oh, I'm here, let's just check each other out. We've got a bull coming from the side now. Let's see how they interact. They did walk down here with him, so I don't think anything's going to happen. But the eyesight of elephants is, some people would say, equivalent to our own. So I'm sure they're able to recognize different individuals by sight. And if someone is very, very different, then I'm sure they'll pick up on that as well. We probably look very similar to them, but I'm sure we all smell uniquely different. The nose doesn't lie. about you Rian, but it's making me rather thirsty having a look at these guys drinking. Mm -hmm.
that the biggest female has decided it's time. We'll see how long it takes the rest of them to follow suit. Zoe, the softest part, well, the smoothest part, most certainly, is behind the ears. That's a very, very soft area, or smooth area. The skin's quite um, thin there. They do a lot of transfer of heat. That would be my guess. And obviously, around the gentle areas, the skin would be a little bit softer. But in general, the elephant, the entire body of the elephant is quite tough, quite leathery, quite robust. I'm just going to be quiet for a moment and see if you can hear all of the sounds emanating from around us. Some splendid quiet moments here. We're going to spend a bit longer. Another relatively hot day here at Eco Training Pride Lands. And you know what we do on hot days. We go to water holes, and especially this particular water hole, which is the only large stable water hole currently. Uh, it's a water hole in the central parts of Pridelands called Ndlovu Dam. And as the name suggests, there's lots of elephants in Ndlovu. means elephants in the local languages. No elephants at the moment. We still have our heron that's resident here. Our geese is also somewhere around. I did see them swim around a bit. Um, what our plan is, I'm thinking to try and find that herd of buffalo that entered Pridelands a little earlier from the east. Uh, this morning apparently and uh, 
I've got a feeling they might actually eventually make their way to this very same water hole that we've seen just southeast of here. So probably going to try now and see if we can't find them, maybe view them a little bit, and then yeah, we'll see. And then with buffalo, there's a chance lions might be following them. You never know. My name is Chris, and with me on Cam Ops is Panda Glitz. Now, our heron, he's just sitting there sunning himself. And I was actually hoping that some elephants would arrive. And that can happen at any moment. They were here a little earlier. Oh, some elephants. But um, other than that, I think buffalo to start off will be great, especially if it's a nice large herd. And then hopefully any cats. It's such a brilliant time this morning with those wild dogs. Uh, that is another option. We can also head back to that area where they were last seen. In fact, there is a couple of safari vehicles that will be heading there. And um, I'm going to rather, for now, avoid the area there. Uh, there's going to be a couple of vehicles operating there, so chances are that they might be found during which We will probably head there then if they are found so that all will depend on what's happening there We will focus on the herd of buffalo for now And at first we're just going to spend a couple of minutes here at the dam Got some war talks approaching us with little piglets. Look at them. Not every day we get war talks that does not run away. There's plenty of war talks out here. There's actually quite a decent population of war talks here at Providence. It's just that to get them on camera is a mission since they always just run away from us. Vinny wants to know how sharp is a grey heron's beak. It is relatively sharp, um, you know, and I'm just going by what I can see. I've never physically touched a grey heron's beak, but from the looks of it, it is very sharp. Uh, it's probably not as sharp as the tip of a sharp steak knife, but enough to cause damage should they pick you. And they use it to great effect when they fight each other or catch frogs. So they don't really impale the frogs or the fish with it. It's just the edges in between the two jaws are sharp, but that is to create more pressure. It's a smaller surface area in order to latch onto a fish or a frog so it can't get out of its beak. Cases are reported where they have actually impaled, but that's not the intention. That is not how they try and hunt those small creatures. No biggies. I see this particular so quite a lot. Shame she had five piglets and there's only two left now. And that's common. It actually happens a lot. A lot of predators like to target those piglets but maybe that she'll pull them through and we'll monitor it right let's head over to Tessa who's very eager to say good afternoon We are just currently bumbling around trying to find tortoise pan, the male leopard, who we were fortunate enough to spend a bit of time with this morning. But my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me today is Igor and we are here in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. So I'm looking forward to all of your questions and comments a little bit, well, you can start now I suppose. Anyways, oh hello, sprinting impala. So this the scene, the scene here looks very different 
There's no impala, barring the one. There's no wildebeest, there's no nothing. And a little bit later, probably about 45 minutes after the show ended this morning, the Sunrise Safari I actually drove up for Yotella Access and all the impala were going crazy and the wildebeest, uh, basically from where we had tortoise pan, just a little bit further south. And they were sort of walking and snorting, kind of like what we'd seen on the Sunrise Safari when he was quite annoyed that he'd been spotted. So I thought, okay, he's obviously, he's obviously crossed the road and he's gone something else. And, and to be honest, I thought that he'd maybe actually even made a kill because they were all staring underneath this bush. But I can't see any tracks of him crossing. So I think what I'm going to do is actually just jump off. Not jump off. I, I don't really necessarily want to walk into Tortoise Band because I don't know what he's like. I don't know if I'm going to chase him. He's going to get a fright and he's going to run and uh, I would not like to encourage him to cross out of Juma uh, because the boundary from where we can't drive is it's not too far and if he crosses that then, then you know that's the end of that so that's the last thing I want to do so I'm contemplating just going in and checking a little bit with the vehicle because I've done a loop now all the way around the roads and I can't see any tracks again there was a big herd of elephants that moved over that area and their tracks are quite fresh so they could have quite easily squashed tortoise pan's tracks and now i can't you know really see them um i don't think he's on that termite mound anymore because that would be in direct sunlight we could see already as the morning went on how um how the light was illuminating him and it's been very warm today so i'm gonna trust my gut and i'm pretty sure it was him but it literally walked here and basically in these bushes up in front of us, this is where I'm talking about, this is where the, the impala and the wildebeest and everything, they were standing here and they're pff, pff, and the wildebeest is going gnu, 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 you know, very unhappily. So I think I would sleep here under all these trees. They provide a nice amount of shade. So I think it's just going to be um, a moment of, let's just check under all the bushes. So I'll go really slowly. And then I'm just going to check from side to side. I'm also going to keep my eyes up in front. But I'm sure he's somewhere here. The other thing that he could have done, because it, it was warm this morning, is that he actually could have just carried on and gone south. Pam! I'm going to sneeze now. I'm really sorry. I'll answer your question in a moment. Is it? Am I going to sneeze? Excuse me. Thank you, Eagle. Uh, Pam is the scent mark of, uh, what is that? Nothing, sand. The scent mark of a leopard can last for a couple of days. It's, it's not particularly long lasting. So something like, for example, a civet that will actually use its anal gland, a uh, really sticky secretion, or even the secretion from the preorbital glands of a wildebeest is very sticky and a different and uh, consistency to what uh, leopards are using to leopards are using to mark uh, their territory so that would probably last a bit longer but with leopards yes they've got the glands in their cheeks but they don't leave like a black paste you know it's a, a very very mild scent and then the urine of course that they are spraying that's going to wash away quite easily with uh, with rain or anything along those lines so a couple of days and that's why we you know if you work in an area for long enough you can almost work out when a leopard is going to walk and scent mark its boundaries. Obviously you have to take into consideration, has it made a kill? Is it eating? Because then it's not necessarily going to be in a hurry at all to, uh, to go off and scent mark, you know, or is it mating? Like, um, you know, Tiani and uh, Tortoise Pan have been mating, but Tiani wasn't, Tiani wasn't seen this morning at all. No one said that they saw her tracks anywhere near Tortoise Pan when they found him. Some birds shouting. Here's my binoculars. I'm just going to, I can't, it's obviously quite thick in there. I'm just going to try and scan with my binoculars to see if I can maybe see anything and possibly figure out why on earth those birds are shouting like that. Can you hear them? There's also a weaver and a couple of other birds. It might not even be a leopard. It could be something like a snake in the tree. 
let's go over and investigate though. Let's, let's go and have a look because there's a number of unhappy birds. So that's one of the things that we sort of listen out for too. You know, it's not just obviously using our eyes and I mean our noses and humans are pretty useless in comparison to animals. You know, we can only pick up really obvious scents. But our hearing is not terrible. Like I said, it could, they could be alarming for something else, but it seems like something's upsetting them. Don't worry, these bush willows are very small and flexible. They're going to all bounce up. Hi guys, what are you shouting at? Let's just, let's just stop and check here, because now there's arrow marked babblers around. There's a chugra that's just flown in. Not in this tree anymore though. So whatever it is is not here. Let's go back into the next one. We can't go through here unfortunately. Let's go back nice and slowly. It's just a bit strange that they're all shouting like this. I can't see you. At first I thought they were potentially mobbing something. I'm gonna go around this termite mound very quickly. Sorry for the little bushes. If we don't find anything in here, it's too thick to take the vehicle, unfortunately. Then we'll just have to do a few more loops and see. I would have imagined that Tortoise Pad might have popped his head up by now if he was close by to look at us. Okay. The shouting and screaming from the birds is somewhere just in front of us. I'm going to just scan and listen and see if we can spot what is causing these birds to be so upset. My Chateau Game Reserve has a glowing reputation as one of the most beautiful reserves in Southern Africa. And now, atop a soaring cliff overlooking the Majale River beneath the groves of Euphorbia succulents sits the stunning new Meshatu Euphorbia Villas. These eco-friendly villas echo their beautiful natural surroundings shaped to match the Mapanu parts of Meshatu. Enjoy earthy glamour with a consciousness for conservation woven into every element of these camps within the 32,000 hectare reserve.
And uh, at the moment, it's only the heron that I can see, and the geese are somewhere around. And there's a starling that's coming to drink there at the uh, inlet where we pump. Looks like uh, can't see from here, but it's potentially one of the glossy starlings. I don't have access to my binoculars now. They here, they in my bag. I just love that color of the starlings, iridescence, very iridescent blue color, and it changes with the angle of the sun from a purple to like a black greenish color. Very, very striking birds in terms of their appearance. What else is around? Barbara, good day. Barbara is asking what other types of birds do we see around this particular water hole? Barbara, if you spend enough time here, you'll very likely see the majority of the birds that occur here and are active in daytime. Um, there's probably too many to... But what you will see regularly here, obviously the heron, the geese, starlings, buffalo weavers, oxpeckers, especially when there's animals around. I can actually hear some European bee-eaters, also called golden black bee-eaters. Um, I can hear them chirping, but I can't see them. There's uh, a flock of green wood hoopoos that often fly around here. I've seen uh, a cormorant here. I've seen black stalks. I've seen white stalk. I've seen... African spoonbills, I've seen yellow billed storks. What else is awesome that we've seen here? Oh, one of the students a while back saw a, a crowned, well, not a ground, a crowned hornbill here, which is not a very common bird for this area. It's a bird that is more associated with riverine areas, like proper riverine areas. So, although they are not that uncommon in the rest of the Greater Kruger along river courses. Uh, we don't have any major river courses. Um, and it was only this one bird, so it was likely to be in transit from one area to another. So that was also a highlight. Yeah. And then the usual, the doves, and you know, there's wax balls that come and drink here, fire finches, all sorts of things. I mean, if you sit here, for an extended period and do some intensive birding, you'll probably see quite a number of birds. The thing with this water hole is in terms of its structure. Um, this is why I said if we can get a bit of reeds growing here, you know, it will it will it will diversify the species of birds that visit. Some birds don't like such an open body of water, they like a bit of structure, a staging area before they then head down. And some even make nests in reeds as well. So if we do have reeds, you'll probably find more birds. But not the, it's not bad at all. You can actually do quite a good session of birding sitting at this dam. Tina, Tina wants to know what bird has the loudest alarm call. Sure. I'd probably go for something like a grey luri or grey go away bird as its new name is. I know they're pretty loud. Hardiders are pretty loud. I think a hardider's probably <laughs> the one. Fish eagles make a very long 
loud call, but it's not necessarily an alarm call, but the call is very loud. I'm not sure who's the officially the loudest in terms of its alarm call. Some butterflies here. That's our mating in air. Look at that. And you see that tender? They're going to sit on that piece of elephant dung, and I, I can't see what they are. They for. It looks like monarchs. Where are they now? But I'm not entirely sure. That's a bit too far for me. That. Let me see if it's monarch or acreas, false monarchs or diadems. No, it won't be diadems. Can I get the feeling it's a type of acrea? And they have flown off now. Not entirely sure which butterfly those were. That's the other thing about water. Dragonflies, they breed, yeah. And they hunt for insects here as well. So you can also sit while you do birding. Watch for butterflies. Watch for dragonflies. It could be as rewarding as doing birding. And at the same time, you have the chance to see something big in terms of animals that come and drink. I heard a woodland kingfisher around as well. Namusa wants to know, how do birds keep themselves cool when it's very hot? All right, so mostly by panting, or it's an action similar to panting where they in and exhale very quickly, and uh, much like a dog panting. So the same effect. Happens where you get heat exchange with the air going in and out. So that's how they do lose heat. Uh, they can go and bathe themselves, but they can't do too much of that because it will disturb the feathers too much. So bathing is just to clean them. Some birds have taken this to a next level. For instance, the Namaqua dove. It can survive in very, very hot areas. It's got a more efficient way to get rid of heat where they don't physically in and exhale using the, you know, uh, you know, they do what we call guttural or gular fluttering. So they just literally vibrate the throat membranes and that actually forces air in and out. And it's a more energy efficient way to get rid of heat as opposed to actually panting. I'm not sure if it's called panting, there's another term for it. But So the thing is they can't sweat, it will be futile to sweat if you're covered in feathers. The only way it can escape is through the mouth. And then obviously with urinating and defecation, that also does take some heat away, but you can't do that all the time because you will dehydrate. It only accounts for a very small percentage of heat loss. And you can imagine they produce a lot of heat. Flying will create a lot of heat it's a lot of energy that gets burned while they fly so heat, heat management is a very important thing for birds talking about dove you can hear that emerald spotted wood dove in the distance Sad call. Sounds very sad. You can hear a 
bit of it there in the distance. A couple of impala now arriving, you see. You just have to remain at the water oh, and the animals will start coming in. They will start to approach. Timing is vital though. You have to be there at the right time. The wrong time of day. Then you won't necessarily see things. It's quite hot now. I suspect we might we might get some animals coming in. If not, we'll go and find them ourselves. But I'm really hoping that that herd of buffalo makes their way here. That did seem like it could very well be the direction they were pointing into. There's the woodland kingfisher that I just heard. It's always nice to just appreciate the peace and quietness of a water hole. Fiona wants to know why is that most birds have thin legs. Fiona, the legs of birds, remember that most of them are flight birds, so they don't necessarily need to run like an ostrich. Ostrich, big, thick legs, but also compared to its body, it's rather thin. But a lot of it's got to do with weight. So birds are designed to fly, most birds and such. So if you have very thick muscular legs, that's just going to add more weight. So just have it thick enough in order to be functional for whatever the purpose is needed. But it's, it's vital that the weight as such don't go too high. That will just add a lot of unnecessary weight. It's all about flight. One can see some terrestrial birds that spend more time on the ground. Think fowl, chicken, these type of things. And remember what we see as their feet, their legs is actually just the heel and the toes. The larger part of the leg is actually up on the body. And that is rather muscular in some birds, if we think chickens, fowl, ostriches, and so forth. And what we actually see protruding is basically the, the heel and the toes. They actually walk on the tiptoes. They don't actually walk flat on their feet. That's why they bend backwards, that leg. Most of the tibia and the entire femur is further up into the body that we cannot see. It's covered by feathers. Some birds have very, very thin legs. And then obviously some animals like herons and those type of wading birds. Very long legs, but that's made for wading in the water. I'm not sure if I'm live this time, but anyways, what I was saying is that uh, we've been looking for Tortoise Pan, the male leopard, and I can't find him. I can't see his tracks where he's crossed the road. I've checked in between as many bushes as I can before it gets, you know, too thick and the off-roading is a bit ridiculous. You know me, I'm not a huge fan of it. So I'm done now driving off-road unnecessary. We just basically cut through the block once and that was it. So I think what we're going to do now I just want to double check to see if he's actually still on Juma and he hasn't perhaps carried on walking for a little bit uh, when we left him up on the uh, termite mine. He looked quite settled in though. So we're going to head down towards a, a big pub uh, public boundary road 
just to the south of us, to the right of us now, and then just have a quick scan to see if he maybe crossed over there, because it's quite possible that he's, he's actually gone and I'm just driving around in circles chasing a ghost. It wouldn't be the first time that that's happened. And then, of course, we're going to do something different. Maybe we'll find some elephants. Like I said, there was a big herd of elephants. I'm not sure if they maybe popped down towards Gauri Dam earlier today, because they were sort of headed in that direction. So if you were perhaps watching Escape to Nature, um, maybe you would have seen them there having a drink. And then, other than that, I don't particularly have too much plans. I think we just might see what sort of happens and what kind of pops out. I need to figure out where Rexon is and what areas he's checking, but he's, he's amazing. That man knows this reserve better than anybody. He's been here for such a long time, so I'm sure he'll pull something marvelous out of, out of his safari hat. Okay, I haven't checked this section, so I'm gonna just now, you can see we're actually on this little power line road that runs all the way to the boundary. So I'm just going to keep going off the road every now and then to just see if I can pick up any tracks. But there'd be no reason or no need for him to walk on the road. But this is kind of the way that he came in this morning. He sort of crossed into Juma just a little bit to the right of us and then marched through. So I'm not really sure. So we'll just keep trying to figure out this puzzle for maybe another 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll let let it all settle for a bit and maybe go look for impala or wildebeest or elephants like I said and uh, maybe check a watering hole I think that sounds like a good idea welcome back to Medique everyone and if you feel like you're looking at a different angle we are here on the deck at Jackie's Tree Lodge having a look out over this pan system at a yellow build stalk. It's on his own. It's only one here at the moment. He's tucked his legs up. It's obviously been a long day of standing. Often find them in quite large breeding colonies. and also moving through areas in the summer months feeding on insects but right now on its own perfect habitat wetlands pans floodplains you can often find large groups that are moving through grass and areas feeding on the frogs and insects that are accumulating but not often seen alone often seen in a pair and uh, very commonly seen in groups of up to 50 individuals sometimes hundreds They only breed in South Africa, generally about August. So this individual has got time to find a partner. Amanda, the strong features of the yellow stalk, it's got that very strong yellow beak. The red sort of element to the face comes down onto the chin. When standing, often see these very long pink legs. Nice large white body with black tail and outer wing feathers but in breeding they can get a bit of a pinkish tinge to them which is quite nice to see that sort of white disappears it becomes very pink very very nice to see So we've 
probably call this individual a resident. Do you see him most mornings when you drive past this pan? And the tail spur file in the background agrees. They are, in my opinion, one of the hardiest of birds. They call throughout the day, in the middle of summer, when most other birds are sheltered away, or other birds that are calling are in the, the shade of trees or in the riparian river on zones. Found a nest once of emerald spotted wood dove that was just on top of a branch in the baking hot sun. watching holes and just take a deep breath. Very peaceful. Up here in the this watching hole. I wonder how peaceful it is down at Antlovo Dam with Chris. Indeed, very peaceful here, Steve. As you will very well know, during your time here at Pridelands yourself, and Lovudam can be a very peaceful place to be, this particular water hole. And what I like about this water hole that it's situated very central in our on Pridelands basically so from a location perspective it's 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 situated you know to such an extent that it's accessible from all sides and it attracts a variety of animals I, I love sitting here we had birds we had warthogs we had herons and now an elephant so our plan kind of like paid off and remember I'm just waiting out the heat of the first bit of the drive and then I'll probably go and explore a bit and see if we cannot find those buffaloes perhaps and I can feel it is starting to cool down a bit now to more workable temperatures It's nice, clean, fresh water. That's what's attracting these elephants here. Always like the cleanest water that they can have. If there's no clean water, then they'll drink what's available.
Ben wants to know from how far can Alex sense or smell water. Ben, I'm not entirely sure if it's the exact distance, but it will be far. But remember, there's no other way to detect water other than smell. Right, elephants might have a different trick there up their sleeves, but the distance can be kilometers as long as the wind carries the scent downwards. If the wind doesn't carry the scent, they won't smell it. Right, so there's no magical way that scent can travel. Other scent are just small matter particles. So it still needs some vector to transport it to another location. And therefore, wind will carry it. Elephants do communicate at a very high level though. So there's an added way that they know where water is. Um, through knowledge that's imparted from older ones who show the younger ones where water can be found different times of the year but I'm convinced that they can also speak to each other and and the long distance say oh we have found water here come here This is a very young bull, still in his teens, uh, but young to be by himself already. And some elephants do leave, especially males, do leave the herds in the mid teens, some a little earlier, some a little later. I'm going to make a combination of the thorns and the bark. That's what I'm going to do. It's basically just a very big open system. But aren't they pretty? Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic morning.
Mm, well, an elephant bull decided to come up and mess up the stork's day. He chased the stork away and he chased away some Egyptian geese because, well, he's just so big and formidable. The stork's now flying around him, up and about in time for another meal. So it is thirsty work out there, everybody. Thirsty work being an elephant and the time spent at pans and watering holes can be incredibly rewarding. I know I've spoken about it before. I once spent three days at a watering hole camping, a little, well, sort of camping, in a little rondavel next to the water. In three days we just sat there and watched the watering hole and goodness me did we see a lot of animals. Saw two sets of lion sightings, saw a number of rhino sightings, lots of elephant, saw wild dogs twice, saw wild dogs kill an impala or chase an impala into the water. And then hippos decided that the impala was too much of a threat. The impala never came up again. But one of my favorite things to do, some coffee, some snacks, binoculars, spend some time at some watering holes in the African wilderness you often be greeted with some very special sightings Nicholas isn't it picture perfect Imagine sitting here sipping your favorite cocktail and just watching Africa unfold in front of you. It's one of those things that can really improve the quality of any meal. I mean, you can go to hotels across the world and lodges across the world and you can eat food, you can eat world-class food. But you sit here on a deck eating quality food and you have animals coming down to drink. It just tastes that much sweeter. Don't forget everybody, this is a live and interactive experience. Please do send me whatever questions you like or let me know what you'd like to chat about on this afternoon safari. It is your safari after all and we are happy that you're joining us here. The action never stops.
had a garden of Eden indeed. So, an interesting fun fact from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Elephants are able to uh, suck up three liters of water in their nostrils a second. Now, think about that. That is 30 times faster, apparently, than a human sneeze. 150 meters per second. 330 miles an hour. Can't be 30. That's very fast. That's a very quick pump. They dilate their trunk, obviously. They pull the water up. Anyway, from about five to six liters or so. And then they turn their head back or up and their trunk pushes the water in. So sometimes you see an elephant go to the water and just touches the water and immediately pulls its trunk up because it's already got a little bit in. I thought that was quite a nice, interesting, fun fact. Of that water is drunk. A fair amount of it is dropped onto the floor and then some of it is also thrown onto the body to assist in cooling. Okay well I hope Taylor's keeping nice and cool down in Juma. Let's go and see what she's found. got a different bird of prey that I've actually seen flying around for the last couple of days but haven't had an opportunity to present them to all of you but in this Maruda tree is a pair of African hawk eagles. Now they don't look like very much at the moment because they have their backs facing us and uh, from this side they don't really show their striking coloration it's very sort of dark feathers but as soon as they turn around you'll see that they've got some some streaking on their breast and then they've got a bright white body with feathers all the way down to their feet and they are one of my favorite raptors or at least the, the smaller birds of prey I don't know if they're nesting on Juma, and I can't actually recall if we've ever found African hawk eagle nests on Juma before, but when I was at Pridelands, we used to see a pair of, well, actually there were two different pairs of African hawk eagles that were nesting on Pridelands, and we would see them on a regular basis. Uh, they are really, really fun to watch, especially when they are out flying around. And I think out of actually all the birds of prey, this is the species that I've seen on more kills than than any other bird so i've seen them catch a guinea fowl i've seen them catch a crested franklin i've seen one with a button quail uh, clutched in its talons um i've seen one eating a squirrel so, and a whole bunch of other things but normally smaller prey like i was quite surprised that they were able, that they caught the guinea fowl because a guinea fowl is not a not a particularly small um bird they are they you know quite large for for a ground ground winning bird and these birds aren't that large themselves i'm just trying to think i'm not exactly sure of the of the measurements but i'm going to guess two rulers and two, that's their length and i reckon the warburg's eagle is somewhere around the same they they're a fairly similar size except these birds are not migrants they are residents they stay here all year round very pretty as well. They've also got a little crest on the top of their heads, but it's impossible to get them and a, uh, a Wahlberg's eagle confused. You can just see one every now and then turning around and revealing that little crest and some of the white feathers that I was telling you about. But right now, I'm not particularly interested in hunting, just perched up in the tree. It's a bit warm. Maybe they're waiting for it to cool down a little bit, or perhaps they've already eaten something. It's a bit difficult to see if their crops are extended, if they've maybe already uh, yeah, caught caught a bird of prey, but they are specialists at uh, catching catching birds. Still actively looking around, though. It's a nice little shady spot that they have, and you almost always see them in pairs. They do everything together. Well, almost everything, but they definitely hunt together.
Jessica, an African hawk eel's eyesight is very, very good. Um, actually, all the birds of prey have got phenomenal eyesight. And I know a little while ago, or a couple of days ago, Steve actually was going in depth about how eyes of birds of prey work and, and one of the special adaptations that they have. So, you know, they are able to, to pick up the UV signature in, in urine of small mammals. Um, with birds, I... I don't think that they have the same, you, you know, uh, UV signature, but also birds don't urinate on their own, you know. It all comes out in, in one go. You'll have a darker part, and especially because these birds are predatory, um, so, you know, they eat small mammals. They'll also catch insects, especially the, the reproductive termites. I've seen them feeding on them too, as a lot of the smaller eagles um, uh, will do. So they're going to have quite a dark piece, and then of course the the white, the uric acid. Um, so I don't, I, I I stand to be corrected though, but I highly doubt that it's the the same thing. And you know, birds don't necessarily defecate and urinate, you know, as as frequently as something like um, maybe a rodent or some other small mammal, small mammal might. So so yeah. So what they'll do is they'll obviously they're not doing this now, but they'll leave the tree and they'll gain a little bit of height and figure out where something is and then they'll lower themselves down and, and very much like uh, if you've ever seen maybe black eagles or varose eagles is another name for them. If you've ever seen them hunting, they use a very similar hunting strategy where they fly around together and one will try and flush out the prey and you know, just get them out from their cover and then the other one will drop down and, and grab them. So it's very much, it's quite a forceful technique is that they'll land straight on top of their prey and literally just crush them into the ground. And then they will use their talons, which uh, feet are very powerful, uh, depending on the size of the prey. And then that way they can also, like, you know, if it's a, if it's a small head of some sort, they can literally just crush the skull. But uh, a really, really beautiful bird, an underrated uh, bird of prey. And I'm glad that we've been seeing them around. Hopefully one day we'll catch them in action because it's quite a spectacular thing to, to see. I've also heard of them feeding on carcasses, scavenging on carcasses. I've never seen it. I've just read it in, in quite a few books that mention this. But again, it would not surprise me at all because of how opportunistic uh, all the animals are in the animal kingdom. Very nice. Shall we carry on? There's a squirrel that's whining. I don't know if it's because it's maybe spotted the the eagles into the tree, but actually we might be able to look at something else. We have another thing that has just crawled straight onto my hand. We have a jumping spider, which was just on the dashboard and immediately saw my hand and jumped towards it. They're quite funny how they uh, how they will actually do this. They are very animated, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'm looking straight at the jumping spider, and I swear it's looking straight towards me too. It's unbelievable, and they've obviously got. I can't. I'm not going to turn too much. They've got their their eyes situated in the front of their head, so they're, they're always sort of looking forward. I think that this might be a male because the petty pulps look to be quite large but I stand to be corrected I've seen it to be much larger in other males before maybe it's not and they're just they're just noticeable you don't need to sorry I'm just moving it because it's now climbing you don't have to be there yeah yeah there we go it's just like but where did you go look at this so animated my favorite family of spiders I don't know exactly which species this is, so if you can grab a, a screenshot and share that with me later, that'd be great. I will definitely try to, <laughs> on the steering wheel, please don't jump towards my face. This is the worst thing. Watch what I'll do. I'll put my hand out here and they just, they do this thing. No, you're going to have to go onto a branch soon. Get off. They're very entertaining, these spiders. They, and this is why I think people like to keep uh, these spiders as pets. Get off my hand. Okay. You want to go sit on my watch? Jump on my watch. He's going to climb up there. There we go. You can also see the time. Hi, little thing. You're going to see your reflection just about. So um, it has become quite a popular trend thanks to social media with people rearing jumping spiders. 
and uh, and keeping them as pets that now it, it's become quite a common thing to sort of do. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't think, I mean, I would listen. I, I always joke and say one day I'm going to have a caterpillar rearing room and also one for spiders of the Saltisidae family. <laughs> oh, you just won't sit still for long enough that we can get a nice close-up view, but this is quite typical. They're very active spiders and they very rarely sit still. I think that if I was a spider, I'd probably be a spider in this family. Hey. Where are you? I'm of course going to take it off of the car and put it on a plant. But what a wonderful show that this little creature has put on for us this afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone and welcome in a beautiful, lovely afternoon. It's a great, great afternoon from us. We are live from Sparky, from myself, Rexen, and Mopo behind the camera. We're looking for the great afternoon. As you can see, there's an elephant in front of us coming our way and heading straight direct to the east. It could be heading towards the water source. I believe there's lots of elephant activity this uh, time of the day because it's now time for water. You can see he's having a mission, walking so quickly, and the trunk up getting a scent is how the elephant communicate and how actually the elephant can read water from the distance. They use the trunk in order to get the scent. Remember, all these animals that walks up here, they leave scent behind, is how actually the elephant doing that. Also, the vibration of water, it can tell us pretty much the direction of water from the elephant as they walk around in the area. He disappear in the area, no-go area. Maybe he's after a marula, you can see. He's moving from one tree to another. Maybe there's a marula tree. There's quite a lot of uh, elephant activity in the property at the moment. Let's head towards the west. We were lucky this afternoon. There were lots of tracks that we read up to so far. There's one tracks of a leopard that cross into the south and there's other tracks of a female and male leopard north of Juma Conservation. We are going to work that area soon. The sun settles down. You know that is in the nature of a leopard to hide in the course of a day like hot day like today. Let's take this um, uh, road called uh, uh, Mamba Road and head slowly to the west. Maybe we might be lucky with something here. Who knows? I'm so excited. I mean, finding all these tracks. First five minutes of a drive. I was on top of the leopard tracks and luck, unlucky enough he had it uh, across to the south. If he does come back it will be uh, twin dams that area but with the male that we have seen around Tamboti it might be still north of uh, Galago, Galago Pen. It may, might be one of the water source that might be really more important for that leopard, a male and a female leopard later on to use that water source. Maybe, who knows? I would like to see Kalamba in the area. I'm so well excited because this is the area where I grew up and I understand the movement of leopards around in the area. Then I can follow up. And let's take this opportunity and see if Steve can manage to follow his bed. Welcome back again everybody and so lovely to hear Rexon through my earpiece there as well. Our yellable stork has gotten busy and uh, just before he came to us he caught a fish. Now this very typical feeding behavior of the stork. They walk through the, the shallow areas, the inundated wet flat areas where there could be all sorts of organisms hiding in the the debris underneath the water in the little vegetation, the organic material in the mud. They'll often move their feet, kicking up, and their beak sits open like that. And as something moves through the beak, it snaps shut with rip, rap, huge speed, and then they can catch whatever it is that they manage to ensnare.
might even see them stirring their foot slightly, agitating. Sometimes, like we've seen with black egrets, they'll open their wings to shade slightly, they'll do it with one wing. So its diet consists of mainly fish, but we'll also take frogs, insects, worms, crustaceans, and possibly even small mammals. Margaret, I'm not sure of any fish in these freshwater systems that could be harmful to the stork. If anything, this this bird is after the fish, so it's only a fish of about 150 grams or so. Any bigger than that becomes a little bit difficult. So maybe bigger than 150 grams could lead to a choking reflex. I don't think it would be able to ingest it. Bearing in mind when birds catch things, they swallow them whole. Hiding behind the vegetation, thinks we can't see him. Could be a her. I do apologize, I do often use that. Okay, well now he's hiding behind the vegetation. We might move across to some of the animals on the other side that come down, or coming down to drink. Honey badger, you're loving the diversity. Water is life. Water is the currency of life and so many organisms need to come here. It's a great place to wait. don't have a monitor like I do in the vehicle, so it's not always easy to see exactly what Rion is framed up on. A lovely group of zebra. An impala in the foreground. Wonderful views of some young zebra. Falls in. Score core pan. Waiting for. And happening with our predators, you'll check. Often we check in the watering holes to see who's around, looking at the shade in and around the ambush specialists. They need to waste energy moving large distances to hunt. Very common practice to find predators shading themselves close to water. And our stalk is at it again. Back here in Okorio. Actually, we're here in Juma. Lovely boons and impala. The wind picking up quite a bit right now. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
So lovely just to spend some time with these impalas and the baboon. But time for us to head over to Taylor and see how our bumble's going. Right, checking a road. We, we basically went to towards a place called Baobab Dam just to see if there were any leopard tracks heading in that direction, but no luck. And now we are driving back in a southerly direction again because this road that I'm driving on doesn't look like it's been driven for a few days. There's like very old elephant tracks, but you can barely see any vehicle tracks, which is great for us because you know, I can kind of understand, okay, did something walk here this morning. But um, what I did find, and I forgot to mention it to you, is we obviously went and checked that boundary road to the south on Triple M, like I was telling you, and there were female leopard tracks that were coming out of Simbambili, which is interesting because this morning we were obviously with Tortoise Band, we were expecting to see uh, Tiani, who he's been mating with. Tiani is the daughter of Salahesh, another female leopard. We, don't, we didn't see, really see her too often. She kind of lives in the west, just out of uh, an area that we can drive. And, you know, I just sort of like, well, the guards hadn't, the guards hadn't seen her at all and they didn't see her tracks either. And then there was obviously no sign of her around here. Um, so maybe she's still trying to track Tortoise Pan and try and meet up with him again. But the problem with that road is that it's so busy during the day. So when the tracks crossed through the middle of the road, there's no evidence of them at all. So we couldn't also find if she did cross into Jumo or if she, but she perhaps went back south. Um, so we're gonna still scratch her on that side. I did just hear on the game drive radio though that Langa, uh, Sibuya's uh, daughter, is in Little Gauri and she has made another kill, which is great. So she's doing very well. We obviously had a very brief sighting of her a few days ago now. So I'm glad that she's, uh, she's feasting. I don't know what she killed though. There's lots and lots of leopard action around. But uh, nothing happening here right now at the moment. All the ladies are coming. Jason, while I'm being cinematic. From the sublime to the ridiculous, everybody, of that ethereal and unattainable thing, the happy marriage. Be nice to see him. <laughs> this is an unbelievable afternoon.
so it seems like maybe their agendas are two two different uh, two different things uh, that Tiani would like to mate and tortoise pan is like I'd like to scent mark because there was another male leopard walking around in my territory today so we're back on the main road that leads to Juma I think I think what we'll do is Maybe we can drive Zoe's and then jump on and go back around to the west and check Impala Plains. It's cooling down nicely now. So they could potentially be up and moving around. I'll of course also go back to the area where I last uh, saw Tortoise Pan and keep checking. Maybe he even... See, there's no need for him to necessarily go towards Galago Pan. Obviously, my mind started thinking maybe he's going to want to have a drink. But there's so much water available at the moment. They can drink from any puddle. Sure, well, that is a, that's a good, good question about what skills do you need when it comes to tracking a leopard. I think we can actually say tracking any animal. Um, a lot of patience. You need to practice quite regularly. So the first skill that you need to have is to be able to identify the tracks of that animal. So, so of different species. That's going to be the most important thing because if you can't even tell the difference between a leopard and a lion track for an example then how do you know what you're going to be following you also need to be able to um, tell the difference between the sexes a male and a female tra track will be hugely beneficial i'm now not talking about necessarily a wildebeest track you know or being able to tell the difference between male and female and parlor tracks but let's let's just we'll keep to uh big cats for now seen as though you asked specifically about leopards so that's super important and then to have some basic understanding of leopard behavior or animal behavior in general like what are their habits what do they like to do obviously not every single leopard is the same but we can sort of put a blanket term across for general habits of of these species and and then kind of go from there and then it's literally just practicing Obviously, before you even think about starting to track leopards, you need to try and get your eye in. So I always recommend do something that's obvious and easy. Don't set a task that's too difficult in the get-go. You want to see how you can improve and you want to make it easy for yourself the first time. So get someone to maybe take their shoes off and walk in the sand and then see if you can follow their tracks and make it more difficult. Then walk and then cross a water, like, you know, a stream or go into the grass and come back onto the road, you know, do a little loop around something, you know, try and make it a bit more tricky. Obviously when, a, a, you know, leopards aren't thinking about how we're going to lose these people when they're walking necessarily, they're just focusing on their day very much. And uh, we're trying to pick up on, on where they've gone. So, I'm just, uh, sorry, I'm just deciding if, I think I'm going to go back down the power line road. I think I must do that actually. My gut's telling me to go that way, so we'll try and listen to it today. Um, so yeah, and then start like that. And then obviously, the more time you spend on a reserve, the better you get to know the movements of the individual animals. So leopards have, like we've just seen, you know, this morning I was explaining how tortoise pan has got a favorite route when he comes onto, onto Juma. He almost crosses in at the same, ex same spot with, you know, give or take a hundred meters. And he, he does the same thing. Pop, up, up, quarry trees pan turn around come back down again it's, he's a creature of habit so it's trying to figure that out that's also very useful information so that if you do lose the tracks you can go oh cool i've tracked him before and the last time he did this maybe he's done it again and more often than off than uh, the not they've done it again so that's what we're just trying to figure out now. But uh, Rexon, of course, is also driving around and looking for all sorts of wonderful things. Let's go to him and see if he's picked up on anything else. Thanks for joining us from Taylor. Look what we have here. Such amazing, beautiful, beautiful animal. We have hippopotamus, the male hippo, and uh, we have ducks next to the hippo. It's very, very important animal that we have here in all species that are aquatic species that lives in water and benefit inside water. Why I'm saying this, if you look at the hippo, is one of the species of course that can transfer or transport fish from one side to another or eggs of fish from one side to another 
it's so important you find that because they have all webs the feet they have webs once they move out of the water they really sometimes get hook the eggs and move with it if it really goes to another dam from here is going to deposit uh, uh, those eggs similar with these species that will be in frame now they have web feet here we have G egyptian geese and knob duck all of them such amazing they're living peacefully and they're so important on all for all species that lives in water to transport eggs or fish from one our dam to another. It's such an important animals to have because they benefit, I mean, other species that live in water as far as bubbles, terrapins, and all fish eagles, they benefit a lot from these uh, species. Moving, transporting eggs from one side to another and have fish for all these water sources. It makes leopards, it makes fish eagle to survive. Such amazing and they're so peaceful. In most cases, you find these species compete a lot. They fight to be in the same water source, but here we see them living peacefully. They're all grass eaters. They don't eat fish. They live in the water. In most cases, they're only to defend themselves from their enemy. What might be snakes, leopard, of course, and other species that really likes to hunt them as water monitor lizard. Oh, look at this boy. He's such amazing and more excited. You can see that he's really uh, making all action try to announce himself he is territorial he might be the one strongest male in the area i might be wrong that he is maybe he's a male that escaped from the pond it happens that quite a lot he defeated and now he have established his own area waiting for female he's strong enough he cannot move to um, another pond as you know that the same species of same gender as the territorial they can fight let take this opportunity from the hippopotamus to Chris who is going towards the waterhole. Oh lovely. The way he's so excited you can tell that the weather is going to be good today. It could be one of the day where it's going to rain. Who knows? Or he knows that if it's raining in the area the more this waterhole get filled up, is the more he can really uh, love, love by the females, the water source, of course, to come and live with him. If the water is becoming scarce like this, it's really threatening because if it happens that the female get more interested with this male and mate with him, what's going to happen? They have to stay in the same water hole. They cannot move because moving from this water source to another, it can cause a death for the youngster. You know, these are, are really serious territorial species. If a female have a youngster that doesn't belong to him, he's going to kill that uh, female youngster and let the female to be in oosters, then he can mate. Lovely, look at that. A very good uh, relationship between the oxpecker and the hippo. You tend to be, you see that quite a lot, landing on a hippo in order to, re, I mean, remove ticks and other parasites that might be in the skin. As you know that uh, all the oxpecker like eating ticks and also eating blood in most cases. I love hippo. It's one of the species that uh, stay in the water in the course of a day due to the skin sensitivity of the animal itself. The skin doesn't like heat, of course. If he spend a lot of time out of water, it might cause himself a very serious damage. Uh, he can get skin cancer, he can die out of that. So during the course of a day, the skin itself does have a membrane that really suck the water like a sponge. If it goes out in the course of a night, even if it's windy, or dry whatever the membrane will release look what he's doing there it's a sign that is now is defecating and that is a part of uh, being territorial in this water source you know that hippos they only territorial inside water outside water they cannot be territorial the home range species they cannot fight if they are in a grazing land even if they come across with the stronger male what does they will be really enjoying grass. But once it comes to the water itself, is where the dominance start. The territorial will start in, within the area where they live in the pond. It's such amazing. They're similar with the rhino. Rather, they have the same attitude. 
in the area where they graze most cases more especially in a very drought season you tend to see that they can accommodate one another to be in the area where the dominant male can be more especially if most of them dries in the area you find one water source is functioning for all species that might be in the area they tend to accommodate that I like this opportunity to tell and see what you have found. I feel like I can sigh. It's a sigh of relief because we have found Mr. Tortoise Pan. And uh, goodness gracious, he's obviously just been sneaking around uh, off the road. I, th I really do think that the elephants did like I can't even speak now I'm so happy whoo that paid off but anyways I feel like the elephants completely uh, destroyed his tracks on the road and that's why we weren't able to see them however I do not see Tiani anywhere nearby right now but um Tortoise Pan is actually looking at some impala so I think it'll be quite cool to follow him this afternoon and try and stick with him for as long as possible as he goes on a walkabout where I'm sure he'll continue his territorial patrols and and hope maybe even better try and catch something I just want, I think someone is looking for me on the game drive video I just want to double check is there a station looking for me afternoon Taylor um, yeah sorry I just wanted to ask for an update on TP that you guys had there at Sandy Plains this morning. Dion, I've just located him. He is. We are between Impala Plains and the Power Lines Road. So if you just come along, you know, that stretch of road between the two, um, you'll get my visual. He is mobile, more in a westerly direction. All right, copy. Um, okay, I'll try and make my way there. How far would you say from um, Double M is it? I don't know, I don't have a GPS, but if you make your way into the area, I'll give you an update uh, when you're closer. Okay, sorry everybody, I just quickly wanted to, because I'm sure a few people will want to come and see him. So let's go in now. Bef sorry that I just had to jump on the game drive radio and sort that out. I'm just going to stop here. Again, I'm going to keep my distance from him because he's very actively looking at some Impala. So I won't jump ahead of him today. I'll stay either in line with him or just behind him. Actually, that's quite cool. Let me go back. He's hiding in a wattle, an African wattle now. It's not going to be the most perfect view, but you can just see how um, his behavior is very different from what it was this morning. This morning, he was sawing. He was very actively marking his territory. And now he's got like this little glint of excitement in his eyes. And uh, I think, obviously, mating with Tiani has taken it out on him. His condition still looks pretty good, though. Um, and then all the territorial marking this morning, he's now hungry. He's thinking about something to eat. And this is a great area to hunt. The only, the only problem is, is that he was obviously very vocal about his arrival this morning. And that sent everything in a complete opposite direction. So there isn't as much impala or the wildebeest as they were today they've all sort of moved out of the area so it's, it might be a little bit tricky for him that he might have to move quite a distance but there were two impala rams that were sort of sitting around here but they and they ran straight past him but he didn't make the move he was just sort of sitting in the grass watching them and i reckon he probably could have grabbed one if he really wanted to Thank you, Debbie. That's very sweet of you to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that our leopard luck is improving. I, I think I was, it's probably because I was whining and saying, mm, then we get to see leopards. But I've always said I'm the worst leopard tracker in the history of guides. I don't think I'm particularly fantastic at it. At, uh, where I live, I seem to be better at tracking leopards. Um, but here, well, we've, we've seen, I suppose we've seen a few leopards and we found a couple by following their tracks. There he is now, he's just slinking off to the next bush. You can just see by his behavior, he's sort of keeping a little bit lower. His tail is not raised. There we go, still scent marking though. Ah, I think he's just woken up. <laughs> 
big yawn. It's gone very quiet as well. So it keeps looking in that direction and that's where the Impala ran. The Impala didn't snort, they didn't do anything. I don't even know if they actually saw him lying down in the grass. Yeah, he's definitely just woken up. Perfect timing. I am, I do think though he might be my new favorite male leopard in the Northern Sabi sand. He is a beautiful cat. He's a beautiful specimen. I think, let me reposition. Sorry, cause he's just gone behind some tree. Actually doesn't even see where he went. Is he straight ahead of us? Okay. I was looking, looking down at the monitor for a sec. Oh, no, we're in low range. Okay, so oh, there he is. Hi, boy. You're very camouflage for a second. I'm just going to move this side a little bit, just to give him a bit of space. Not that he's particularly worried about us. He's not even glancing in our direction. Oh, I'm so sorry. I completely missed, uh, missed that question from Dorothy. My apologies. Rusty likes to rumble a bit loud, and I don't. Uh, Turn my ear, uh, radio down a little bit. He might even come straight towards us now. Um, Dorothy, I don't know if, you know, for example, a male's not going to actively send Mark for mating purposes. However, and then it's the females that normally sort out the males. So I don't know if they are actively doing that. I mean, for the most part, I think that they, the, what they really send marking for is as a deterrent to other leopards. Like, hey, there's a big, I'm a big man in the area. This is my space. I don't really appreciate it. If you come into my territory, if you do, I'm gonna try and find you and I'm going to chase you or growl at you. Let me go back in this reposition again. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not really sure. I don't. I don't think they're actively doing that. You know, like, hey, I'm here. I mean, like, elephants are interesting, is um, obviously males when they're in must specifically they'll like go out and search for females and keep testing urine and, and dung on the ground to see if one of them are in estrus, and then the females also sing an estrus song. They send out these rumbles which is uh, different, but I, with leopards, I, yeah, I think if a female hears another male or picks up a male scent and she is an estrus, she's going to try and find him. But anyways, we're going to carry on driving along here and by the sounds of it, you're going to go and check out a water hole. My plan worked like a charm. I knew, and Lord of damn, at some stage, something will arrive. Elephants swimming. I just watch them for a second. This is very entertaining. And it's not the only thing that arrived here. Yeah? What did I say earlier? This herd of buffalo that was seen this morning. I was certain that they're going to come here. And there they are. Not a very big group. About 20 odd. Quite a lot of bulls. There's one or two cows in between. Very odd makeup of a herd of buffalo. Ah, how awesome is this? We've got the geese swimming there, there's elephants swimming, there's buffalo drinking. <coughs> and we don't even know where to look. This is spectacular. The dam, the dam, the dam is productive. Very, very big buffalo bulls in this herd. Lots of young bulls as well. Cynthia 
it's indeed a private Friday pool party. Synth is just commenting on this pool party with buffaloes, and geese and herons, elephants. Lovely, lovely stuff. See some of these buffalo also just literally dropping down in the water to also get a bit of relief from the sun. Obviously quench their thirst. They need a lot of water. Buffalo needs to drink twice daily. They need a lot of water to aid their digestion to fill that big rumen stomach with water. It's a very important component of the ruminating process is to have it filled with water. And there's more elephants coming. Goodness! Good afternoon, Ruth. And the question from Ruth there, would the elephants eventually chase these buffaloes off? Ruth, uh, I've seen that happen a few times and that's often when the water holes are in low supply and if it's starting to dry up, buffaloes uh, are quite messy when it gets into the water. They often move into the water, so they stir up a lot of sediment making the water dirty for a little bit afterwards before that sediment sinks down again. But in this case, the water hole is a very wide, big water hole. There's space for everybody. So therefore the elephants, there's another elephant coming. Goodness gracious. And another one. They just keep coming. Were you thirsty? opening his mouth. He's very hot and thirsty. There's some lovely sweet water for you there. You can have as much as you want. All the other elephants have moved away now. You can have it all for yourself. This is lovely. Thank you for joining us from Big Heart of Elephant and the Buffalo from Friedland. We are here at uh, Juma Safari Life. We are going to check one of the uh, and looking forward to the Inwe Ali great for me to check this area and they're a lot more productive I know that most of the time you tend to see a leopard's movement in this this drainage line that we have here we have lots of drainage lines that's moved more south of the lodge pretty much you find Talamba loving moving in there. It's in the nature of a leopard to really prefer a drainage or drainage line or rivers because they can be always surprised. The species is a lot more thick. They surprise a lot of animals because they can hide well and hunt in that area without noticing by anything in the surrounding. You know that bush buck, Nyala, love the area. Only the impala, you tend to see them uh, like in the open spaces, not far, especially in the water source, in a very hot day. We just cross our finger, something's gonna happen here. Totos Pen is more to the west. I might find Tewengume, I might find Telamba. Who knows? It's promising. 
are finding evidence of a leopard movement in the area, hoping that it will be a great afternoon. We're looking forward, of course, to see Kalamba. It's been a while she has been sighted around in the area. By now, I think she might be hunting and more successful due to the season of the impala. There's a lot of baby impala. There's a lot of water everywhere that makes the impala hiding a lot. And Juma is very thick compared to Prideland, where I was weeks ago. It looked like uh, here Juma has been raining hardly. I'm loving the stalling, the butcher stalling. You can tell that it's hot in the area. They're not moving anyway. How cool is this? So he, you know, we were talking about earlier about him not necessarily having to go towards Gallego Pan to have a drink. He arrived at a mud wallow, had a drink for about a minute. You could barely see him, he was hidden in the grass, and then walked around and sat right in front of the car. How cool is this? <laughs> you can barely see him. So, obviously he's sat down right here. I don't want to move right now, because, he, I mean, I don't think he's going to do anything, but he is sitting, not quite close, it's a bit, it's a bit deceiving, he's probably about two and a half three meters away from the car pretty close to a leopard though but uh because the you can't actually see the ground in front of us but this just again just goes to show how relaxed these animals are so he came from over here these are the wallows that he was drinking at and he walked all the way around doo -doo 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 -doo, and then went bloop, and now he is doing a bit of grooming so of course, once he gets up again and carries on, we'll give him a little bit of space. But there is also a another vehicle in the sighting now with uh, with his guests, which is quite cool. So they've got a fantastic view of this uh, of this male leopard. And um, I got some information from some of you, so thank you, of course, for sharing that. But apparently this the tortoise pan is of um, royalty himself and that he, uh, his great-grandmother, if I'm not mistaken, was potentially the first leopard ever habituated at Londolozi many many years ago it might have been a great grandmother or great great grandmother one of the two the, so that's that's quite epic he he really is a stunning cat and as he gets older and older that dewlap is going to develop even more you can see he didn't even look at the car he's not even interested he knows that uh, that he's he's the boss around here. He's just scent marking again. What I am going to do is I'm going to let this vehicle go in front of us, and because uh, we've obviously spent a little bit of time with him, um, so we'll let them have a nice view, and then we'll just sort of play leapfrog, and and have an opportunity. But again, this is an optical illusion. He's actually not standing right on top of the car. Now he's about 10 meters away from the vehicle, but because of the way that the camera is framed, it seems like he's standing right there. He's actually gone around the corner. Um, so n don't always believe what you see with with cameras. I especially think with what we're doing, it, it appears like things are a lot closer than what they actually are. So yeah, so he's actually quite far away completely. So I don't know if Dion's, Dion, are you gonna hit, go? Yeah, we're gonna let them just carry on for just a little bit. Um, oh, and then what, like I said, we'll just do the, the leapfrog, the leapfrog game. But how epic, what a cool cat. He's so beautiful. He is my new favorite male leopard. That's it done. I love Maribs, but let's talk about territorial male leopards. He's, um, yeah, he's a very impressive individual. I still would love to get the opportunity to spend some time with Molwati. I think I'm only gonna be able to do that maybe at nighttime, which is also fine, because we've got the infrared cameras, which are great. And uh, yeah, he, he, we're actually, we're heading in the direction of Impala Plains now. I'm hoping that Dion is very kindly just going to take hold of this, uh, this sighting. This, it's obviously, I don't need to spend my entire, entire time on the Graham Drive radio, so we'll let him organize everybody. But we should be able to get a, a view. There we go. 
we can maybe have a squeeze. I think Dion's going to let us have a gap. Um, Lenny, so Tortoise Pan, it's actually quite funny. You're not the first person today to ask me, how on earth did this leopard get his name? Um, so Tortoise Pan is the name of a water hole, essentially, or a small small group of pans on uh, Londolozi. And he either he was maybe as a cub spent a lot of time around there or perhaps when he you know was starting to become independent maybe he spends a bit of time around there that i'm not 100 percent sure uh, so so yeah so quite often leopards will get their names from an area that they were hanging around in or where they were born or they might take a, a name you know similar to one of their parents so an example of that is the red hawk male from uh, mala mala that's actually also a young male that's been seen occasionally here in the north so, he, you know, he, we could potentially see him too, and he's a really beautiful cat too, and quite a character. And his... Okay, copy, thank you. Um, and then his dad, the red hawk male's dad, well, suspected dad, a father, is to be the occipita male. And obviously, occipita is the word we use for small birds of prey, or smaller birds of prey. So, so yeah, so it kind of just depends. And that's up to the reserve, where the animal was mainly seen. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's really up to them to decide on what their what their names are going to be. But um, you know how we name leopards in the Sabi Sand could be completely different from how another reserve uh, names their cats. So it's not a it's not a, a set in stone sort of rule. But that's just how we do it typically in this area. And then you know it would have been one lodge that kind of decided on it and then the others, others sort of followed suit to try and keep some kind of formality, especially because everybody's up operating under the same umbrella here in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve. So Dion has said to me, he, when he gets a gap, he's gonna try and actually go off-road and just go around so that we can follow him from behind. And then, you know, he'll just wait for them to pass, but it's actually gonna open up just now. Again, he's just, he's a little bit ahead of the vehicle. Just, he's just stopping and scanning because he's definitely, keen I think on hunting something so while he's got the cover of the trees and he's on the road and the grass is quite tall he's just sort of scouting in this open area are there any impala is there you know can he smell something can he see something can he hear something what's his next move he's really not rushing into anything so again behavior completely different from what we saw this morning not still scent marking but quite calm not as sort of determined and with the potential that, okay, if there's the opportunity to grab an animal, I'm gonna do it. I hope he does because he is heading south, which is going to be off of our traverse. We've still got a bit of time with him, so we'll try and spend as, as long as we can with him. I would definitely like to do that, and I'm sure all of you sitting at home will not oppose to that. So there we go. So Dion's actually, it's quite open here. He's just going around on the open plains. and uh, hopefully going to catch him. Oh, they've also just pointed out that there might, there's an owl in the bushes, so... If, um, if the, when, not if, when tortoise pan crosses out, we'll have to come back here and come and look for this, uh, this apparent owl in the bushes. Igor, you're taking note where we are. <laughs> Shame these poor guests want to really look at the owl. <laughs> They're not getting that opportunity. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to head around and see if we can get another view of a tortoise pan before he disappears. Off you go to a Chris who's waiting for the elephants. Last few members of this herd of buffalo still sort of submerged some of them in the water hole. Still a few elephants around as well. And I think soon all of them will move off. I won't be surprised if more elephants do arrive. It seems to be the time of day for them. <laughs> See how those buffalo, they're just trying to get away from this heat. And it's still quite warm, I can tell you that, even though it's getting closer and closer to sunset. Oh, still, the sun's pretty high still, actually. Heading into that golden hour now. 
where you've got this beautiful crisp light and that's a photographer photographer's dream it's also one elephant dusting themselves on the other side you see when they do a lot of dust like that on their backs that's a sign of a, a day where the sun, the UV index is very high. So the sun's burning. And also how humid, even though it's still relatively humid compared to some other parts of the world. Also, you know, it, it, the humidity is lower than normal at the moment. So therefore the UV index will be higher. So the sun burns harder, literally. Believe me, I felt it. I felt it during the day. Patricia is asking if elephants can track other elephants through vibration. Patricia, indeed. They feel it through their feet and in the trunk as well. Often you'll see the big bulls especially. Where they drop the trunk to the ground, the top part of the tip they bend it there's a couple of very fine hairs there on it it's very sensitive as well as and they can actually feel the ground for vibrations how much detail they get out of that from a sensory perspective i don't know maybe they just feel the vibrations and they can understand that as more elephants approaching we don't know It's not peer-reviewed science, but there's a lot of suggestions that it might be the case. And the question is how far would those vibrations travel? Also, that's something I won't be able to tell you. Cindy D, nice to hear from you as well. Cindy D's question is, how do elephants choose their matriarchs? Cindy D, in a herd scenario, the matriarch is not really chosen as such. The oldest female, the oldest, most experienced females will take the lead. So while a herd might have a matriarch, sometimes the herd splits up into smaller groups for various reasons. And during then, every group, the oldest, most experienced female will take the lead and act as matriarch. So it's, there's no fighting dominance. It's it's. It's about experience and age. You want the matriarch to be a leader, a cow with knowledge where there's food, water, etc. That's her role, is to make sure leads the herd into areas where they will have an optimum chance of survival. And with elephants' long life and very large memory capacity, the oldest cow will have the most experience in an area and knowledge about the area. So it does make sense that that's how they get to become matriarchs. But she also has a position of authority as well. It's almost as if they naturally respect the oldest female 
to be the matriarch. All this healthy female that is. Join us from the 23rd till the 27th of January for a week of back-to-school special safaris tailored specifically towards our future conservationists. Our naturalists will exclusively be taking questions from schools across the globe. Tune in for some entertaining animal education to ease you back into the school year because fostering the upcoming generations of conservationists matters. Lovely, thanks for joining us. We are on the western side of quarantine. I'm looking around here. There was the breeding herd of Alice that moving from uh, Treehouse Dam and moving fairly to the north. We just want to check if they might come into the open, clearing furthermore towards the, the quarantine. If not, they might be still in the thickest here. It's very thick here, Juma. It's very easy to lose the big visual of an animal as far as an elephant so just imagine we might have drive past a lot of animal without seeing we were tracking leopard but we know that uh, leopard uh, soon it cools down they're all gonna come out towards the water source would love to uh, check around here yeah? it could be a lot of things that might be in the area you know that juma conservancy is very rich when it comes to all cats you might be surprised uh, finding maybe Tabangume or any cats, even wild dogs in the area. They prefer a lot in open space as far as quarantine. Stay with us. We'll work around in the area. Don't go far. We might uh, see something. Who knows? We'll take this opportunity and link to Taylor and see if we still have total span. So Tortoise Pan is now on the boundary road. We're just trying to see where he's going to go, but they can imagine there's going to be a lot of vehicles coming here soon. So to his right is Arethusa, and I'm still sitting on Juma. So I don't know if he's going to continue going south. If he does, we won't be able to follow him, but something has caught his attention in there. 
you can see he's thinking and listening. So everybody's actually being fantastic and just giving him quite a bit of room to make a decision for himself as to where he wants to go, which is wonderful. It's always quite difficult to manage sightings on boundary roads, but uh, as soon as there are a lot more vehicles here, what we will do, unless he crosses back onto Juma, is that we will make some space for the other guides to have a look at him because why would you not give anyone the opportunity to view this leopard? He is stunning he is absolutely gorgeous and again luckily for us we can we can of course uh, zoom in but there's going to be a game drive vehicle just now oh they're, they're actually they're, they're pulling off the road that's quite nice he's thinking about it just sort of scent marking watching what he's doing. I don't know what he's smelling now at the moment, but very, very fixated. But again, not uncommon for Mulwati to kind of come this side too, because we're quite far on Triple M now, this boundary road. We're quite far to the sort of southeast. So there could be a number of different leopards that are scent marking here. There might even, of course, be some scents of Shadulu, the female leopard. She likes to spend some time around here too. And uh, not that he'd particularly be unimpressed with Shidulu. I think he probably bumps into her from time to time, seeing as though she also spends quite a good amount of time on the western sides of uh, Juma. Okay, let's catch up to him. I'm so sorry, I, I didn't hear the name of that, but I'll answer the question, that, sorry, I didn't hear the name of the person who asked the question. How far will a leopard go in terms of uh, fighting for its territory? Well, Emma, sorry Emma, my apologies. Um, so, gosh, that's gonna depend on so many different things. Ah, he's crossing now into Arethusa. So I think what we'll do is we'll just bypass everybody and actually, no, we wanna go and look at that owl. I'm gonna let him go. Because he's, he's crossed on now, so I think that was a, a really nice way to end our time with Tortoise Pan. I'll keep an ear out if he does come back. That's going to depend, you know, gosh, whether a leopard is willing to lose his, his life over a territory is one thing, because that, that's the end of him, right? That's it. He can't even then, if he gets injured so badly that, you know, he can't eat, he can't hunt, he can't do all those things, then, then kind of what's the point? So it, it really just depends. Like I said, you don't always see these very aggressive moments. I mean, the most aggressive thing I've typically seen with leopards is uh, their mating. But with males, I haven't seen two big males in a territorial fight before, but I have seen them quite a few different individuals walking side and side and sussing each other out and scrowling and salivating and that type of thing. And I'm sure they have a box every now and then. But um, if it's a younger male leopard with a big, like for example, say if uh, Maribs bumps into Tortoise Pad. Maribs is not going to stand his ground and fight. He's going to get out of there. He does not stand a chance against a big established male like that. So he'll be quite clever about it and actually move on and just try and get out of there as quick as possible without being harmed. But um, for example, with Morwati and say Tortoise Pan, they might have a bit of a battle between one another because their territories do overlap to a degree. And it will just, it, we'll have to see. I mean, they're both big male leopards. I, I don't know. You can't really compare the size. Obviously, size does definitely matter out here in the wild. But then I say that, and I've also seen small individuals, like there's this male leopard. I don't know if he's still around, Mashabeni, the male leopard that I used to spend a bit of time with at Sabi Sabi. He's not big. He's small. He doesn't even have, doesn't have like a dewlap. He's a quite a small male leopard in, from what we typically see in the Sabi sand. And... Uh, yeah, he used to stand his own and challenge all sorts of individuals. So there's definitely some skill involved as well. But yeah, what a wonderful, what a wonderful sighting of him. But he is, he's left the building now. And uh, I do hope that he catches something and is able to have a good feed. Catherine, I don't know if I enjoy tracking. I get a bit tired, and I'm just joking. <laughs> I just want to find the animals in the road and make it must be easy for me. I'm of course just joking, that's completely ridiculous. Uh, 
You know, the thing I like about tracking is that I don't, I don't always find the animals every single time. And that motivates me to want to be better. I think if it was so easy, I'd get a bit bored of it. So I like a challenge. I don't mind if I'm not particularly good at something. That's also okay, because it, it kind of drives me to want to work harder to be better at it. And again, tracking animals in different areas where I haven't spent much time, that's even more difficult because I don't know the behavior of those animals and their favorite routes, etc. Uh, I also like different, seeing a different sign of that animal. So not necessarily a clear footprint in the ground, you know, maybe it's a scuff mark or, you know, trying to, you know, buffalo or buffalo bull that you're trailing or a rhino that you're trailing and then you see, there's no tracks anymore, but you see mud you know, up against on blades of grass. Small things like that, like looking for other signs that can help you or point you in the right direction of that animal without it being a very obvious, um, yeah, obvious evidence. So I think that's one of the things that I, uh, I really like. We are, just now. Ah, okay. Seems as though Rickson has finally managed to find something and it is of the gentle giant kind. Lovely. Look at this beautiful, beautiful light with the guinea on the elephant. We had the trumpeting of the elephant from the distance. We come and investigate in the area. In most cases, you know that once the elephant trumpet, it could be uh, something that they're interacting with. It could be wild dogs, it could be leopards, it could be anything as cat. But what we have found out here is just because this elephant is visiting these beautiful trees called Amarula, at the same time we find that the canoe, they were moving in the same space looking for Amarula. Then we find the elephant not happy with that because really, Elephant this time of the year, they love a marula because they have a vitamin C. They collect quite a lot of marula. It's more important for their body system because they need to gain weight because it's more healthy, a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> vitamins that they can collect. Over the season of a marula, they might collect it from thousand and thousand of them that makes their body build themselves even stronger and more healthy. It's more important, the more you're healthy, the more you respect it. We're all aware that out in nature, anything that lives in nature, survival of the fittest. If you lose the opportunity of a marula as an elephant to collect and make your body strong, you will be easily challenged by other elephant, even species that you compete with them. So it's more important for elephant moving around in the area, migrating in bulk into the surrounding, especially for Amarula, I mean, that are in the area. So we tend to see, or we're going to see quite a lot of an elephant due to Amarula season, especially this month and the end of the month, February, there will be a lot more elephant around in the area. Is where you find that a lot of trees get damaged because more many elephants are in the surrounding. She's just facing more opposite the other way. It could be more elephant around in the area. What we have learned, behavior of males, they all like separated a lot because they don't want to compete when it comes to very healthy Amarula trees. They need to collect, find at their own and able to feed themselves. Lovely, it's beautiful here at quarantine. And we do have this gnu look like with the trust of the elephant, they slowly come behind the elephant and moving particular in the direction of elephant. If there's anything around in the area, as I said earlier on, elephant, we had them trumpet quite a lot. If it's anything as far as cat, is how actually the green will know that is a cat near. They will use an elephant to chase the cat and able to see where the direction of the cat and run in the opposite direction. This is one of the species, of course, also migrate within the Greater Kuga National Park. They have area of preference. They stay in different area around in sense. They can move from here to the south, south, north, east in particular if they really want to. And it's such amazing because the male is the one that always hang around in the area and wait for the opportunity of females to come and join him. 
and mate that is more important for him and this time of the year also you find these guys they have youngster and they're more healthy you can see they're more shining healthy they eat also quite a lot of amarula and prefer an open spaces of course because they have a very poor memory once they get to see danger easily for them to forget but you know that the sense of uh, eyesight and the sense of a smell is very rich for these guys they can see but very easy to forget even if they have seen the lions over many years of my experience following lions that hunt wildebeest i tend to find lions more successful because the lions are easy to forget they'll forget in, in the next 20 minutes that they've seen a lion in the area and they start to pounce and run around in the area and do the rituals of um, being a gnu you know gnu are always calling everywhere around near running and eventually get to the direction of the lions and they get killed either on that way you tend to see around in the area we don't have many many zebra more especially in sand yet juma safari life you tend to see small pockets of them there and there could be ahead of if you find a big head it's less than 20 or sometimes less than 40 of them because they get hunted a lot in the surrounding cheetah lions leopards and wildebeest i mean hyenas the hunt the most special one they're still young a medium size it can take hunted by the uh, cheetah and also by a hyenas a leopard is always in the nature you know that anything that is in a small size you find elephant i mean leopard will take that chances to hunt that where lion pride they can bring a big wildebeest why leopard tend to go for babies they don't want to get injuries because once they have injuries it's the end of life they, they cannot able to hunt because they're not in the social like lions so lions tend to go for bigger animals because they're all in numbers if you get hurt individually you can survive lovely It's such a beautiful look at the youngster there it's in a color almost the color of the uh adult when they get born they're all like tony tonish um, yellowish color like tony color is how actually you can really see the youngster while they're still there but now it looks like they're getting to that stage it could be these very rich ground in the area where grasses are so much rich they easily grow very fast i don't think they're over two months they are less than that it happens that uh, they have water they've chosen an area where half the grass is it's really unbelievable tend to see the migration of uh, wallabies if you're lucky moving in the area far east of the greater Kuru national park where they still do that around those areas with flat ground and flat grasses you find the migration taking place wow Mpo, look at the elephant is using the trunk there i don't know it could be the sense of a smell that is getting maybe it's going to the direction where it could be more amarula because they can really sense that if wind blows in the right direction amarula also have that sense if the more especially if they're ripen on the ground they really give a little bit of a scent which is carried by the wind they can really smell that and go to the right direction most of the time you find the elephant even running when they get to the area in the full season of amarula which it will be february I'm loving this big animal. We'll, we'll get a chance to drive and see what might be a downhill. It could be more elephant that uh, really visiting this area for Amarula season. Oh, lovely. Look at the beautiful Amarulas and the beautiful weather sky, which overcast, colliding a little bit more to the north. Maybe later on. We might uh, experience a very uh, overcast afternoon today. All these trees you see in front of you, these are all Amarula trees, and most of them that do have fruits. I'm still coming down off of the adrenaline since uh, we had tortoise pan. 
He's so lovely. He really is a wonderful cat. And uh, please don't take it that I don't like Mulwati at all, because I've was been thinking, I was like, it's probably coming across that I don't like that leopard. I like all leopards, all of them. I like all lions. I like every single elephant. I'm obviously a bit biased and I like Maurice the elephant the most who's living in my backpack at the moment because the monkeys keep trying to steal him so I have to lock him away. If a vervet monkey takes my stuffed elephant there's going to be big problems. You'll hear me shouting from the dam cam. That's how anxious. Louder than when I shouted at Igor for scaring me the other night. I haven't forgotten about that. He's on the car for the first time. He's been laying low and he's been with Tess every every day now to try and avoid me because he knows he's in trouble and that the payback is coming when it will come he'll never know it may be here it may be one day in cape town I'll just keep him uh, thinking watching his back the whole time what's up taylor i can smell her no no i'm just teasing he doesn't really care um oh there's two birds in the road these are cool birds And if you really want to find, it's actually quite funny, if you ever really want to find ground scraper thrush, you just come and look sort of on either Impala Plains or the road that runs back towards Voyotella Access, um, if you're looking at a map of Juma by any chance. Um, that is where you can find these birds. And always on the ground, they either, actually I lie, they're either always on the ground or they're at the top of a tree. There's no in between with the uh, ground scraper thrush and are quite lovely birds. Very easy to identify. Look at all the uh, sort of spots and or mottling that they have on their, not mottling, mottling is not the right word to use to describe those birds, but stripes maybe? I don't always get confused because ornithologists have changed it. If I look at something, I'm like, oh, that's streaking. And they'll be like, no, 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 that's spots. And then you look at spots and you'll be like, oh, spots. And they're like, no, 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 that's, that's streaking, obviously. I feel like it's opposite day sometimes with <laughs> ornithologists. And we're gonna have another look at them now. Oh my goodness, there's also a hornbill. It truly is our lucky day today, inundated with birds. Not that the three of these uh, birds would typically hang around with one another. Obviously the ground scraper thrush are a pair and the southern red-billed hornbill has just decided to join in and also look for some insects because they kind of eat the same thing, except obviously a hornbill can eat much larger prey species, whereas the ground scraper, scraper thrush will be limited to, to sort of insects running along the road. I love how they do that, how they dip their bodies down, sprint, and then stand up quite tall. And that's also a characteristic when they're up in the tops of the trees, they sit very, very tall. Lovely birds, very pretty. You're just pecking at the ground every now and then. There might be some ants moving about. I once at Pridelands had a, I don't know if it was a territorial thing or courtship, but between two ground scrapers, that was impressive. Now, Josh, you've inquired about whether parrots are the only birds that can mimic sounds. No, although parrots are of course very good at them. The ground scraper thrush over is not one of the mimicking bird species. Forktailed drongos are phenomenal at uh, mimicking other animals. And I say that because they don't just mimic other birds. They mimic, I've heard them mimicking black jackals at Kericha one day in an elephant sighting. It was amazing. And uh, I've also heard them mimicking, uh, we hear them mimicking pearl spotted owlets all the time. So, so they'll do that quite often. And then the other bird that I absolutely love, that's a brilliant mimic, is the, the robin chats are quite good, but specifically the chorister uh, robin chat. Is it a chorister robin chat or chorister robin? Robin, no, they're all robin chats. Chorister robin chat. A uh, beautiful bird. Also in at Kariha Game Reserve. One day we we're down in the, so, I, and you haven't explored Kariha uh, very much, but if you do get the opportunity to, so you get these big hills and then they go, drop down into these valleys and the valleys are amazing. They've got these yellow woods, these little streams. 
the bird life in there is fantastic. White starred robins, Narina trogans, um, white mantled crested flycatchers. I always mix those up around. But anyways, and you also get the chorister robin chats in there. And uh, of course, just so you know, we're going to look at a ground scraper thrush. This is not a chorister robin chat. And the one day I'm sitting there and I can, it's during the day and my guests and I just stop having like a little late tea and coffee, enjoying it, just listening to the sound, trying to get a picture of a Narina trogan. The next minute, I hear a fiery necked nightjar, which is a nocturnal bird, and I'm like, what is going on? And I can hear it, and I can hear it, and then I hear a fish eagle. And I'm like, what? But now they're not perfect calls, but they definitely resemble those two birds. And I was like, no ways. And the guess, obviously, one of the first calls that people learn is that of the, uh, uh, um, what is it called, the uh, African fish eagle. So I said to my guests, I was like, hang on, hang on, we've got to do a bit of investigating here. So we, we sort of walked it a little bit, binoculars like this, listening, and then we find this Chorus Robin chat. And it was so epic. So that, that's probably the coolest mimicking I've, uh, I've ever heard. And I was quite surprised because uh, the reason why I was surprised that it was mimicking a fiery neck nightjar is that Chorus Robin's a nocturnal bird species. You know, they should be asleep. But I suppose if that's all you're hearing at nighttime, you know, it's quite funny that they... Um, yeah, that they were doing that. So very interesting though. These birds have not got the prettiest call. I can't even mimic it. But uh, perhaps when we are away from these birds, I will, I will play the call. I don't want to play it now that we're so close because we might get a reaction from them. And you, you have to really be quite sensitive about using a bird call. Some people will be like, oh, but they're just birds, you know. But still, we can really affect them, especially if they are territorial, you know, if it's during breeding season. You don't need to, you don't need to sort of mess with them. So if you are learning bird calls, you know, a pair of headphones, that's even better. Um, or just keep your volume a little bit lower uh, because, if we, oh gosh, we're training, training students or people to become guides is quite interesting. And one of the things they have to do is learn bird calls and we test them on it, not just by sight, but also by sound so having to explain to them you know please don't play a pearl spotted owlet call or a barred owlet or a african um no green wood hoopoos you know or even the crested barbets and things like that that all respond like you know please play those calls quite quietly or you know if you can use headphones because all these birds all of a sudden will be sitting around in camp going yeah, you called, you know, you rang, now what? So please, if you are using bird calls, please use them sparingly. They say that the general rule is, well, again, I suppose it depends who you're talking to, but if you are trying to get a photo or see a bird and you are trying to call it, and it's not the greatest thing to do though, don't play it more than once. Just play it once, leave it, maybe play it a second time, but then give up. You don't need to continuously start blasting that call. Um, so just be quite sensitive about that if you don't mind. Okay. Right, right, right. What next? Sorry. I've just, one flew off and the other one is now also flown off. Oh no, there's the other one, no. Okay. Let's see if we can get a, I don't know if we're gonna be quick enough to get a closer view. There's one just sort of there. Just sitting in a tree now, you can see it quite nicely. That is lovely. Thank you, Ground Scraper Thrush, for being so accommodating this afternoon. Right, off you go to, to Rexon to see where he is now and what he's got for you. Thank you for joining us here. We have this uh, young bull in front of us. He's still here to quarantine. It's really look at the uh, body language of the elephant itself, very relaxed. If you look at the coloration on the legs, on the body itself, it tells us the history, what was happening in the course of a day with this elephant. If you look at also how this elephant behaving, it can tell that uh, he's not overheated. Of course, he might be due to the history of the skin and the color. He might be in the water wallowing or swimming, and he come out from there and able to graze around in the area. In the nature of the elephant, they're really in the body system itself. They absorb heat quite a lot for a certain percentage that they cannot able to really manage to 
really stay out they have to go back to the water once the temperature exceed on that percentage elephant has to go down to the water and turn to wallow or swimming in order to cool down the body system itself is what is happening here it's very hot and now the wind is picking it looks like a little bit of breeze of course there's reason you see the flapping of the ears it hasn't happened that quite a lot that the elephant itself is in a very good temperature for himself to be out and graze around in the area being young which are, I can really estimate in the age of 25 to 28 years on that range he is he's more in, interested in something anything that might be in our area of course as far we had them trumpeting due to a wildebeest is really need uh, a big elephant to teach him how to behave out in nature something sometimes it goes out of control because he doesn't have a scurry that able to uh, transfer the skill but by me looking and the body language of him is more like accommodating everything even us being in the area you can see that uh, head is dropping low down he doesn't show any aggressive or anger towards anything so he's really in a good space where we can stay with this particular elephant in most cases you find the young males like his age they tend to be so much aggressive due to the cost that they don't have much experience to handle the situations of others animals or even vehicles sometimes you tend to see them responding but it's really surprising me because I've been here looking from west to north, also south. I don't see any elephant around in the area. It could be due to Amarula. These guys, they really like Amarula trees a lot in the season where they can travel along and able to benefit to really make themselves even better image of the species, more healthy. Look at that, they're extending the trunk, they're not even pushing the trees which he does have experience a lot. You tend to see sometimes, more especially when the elephant's in mass. When he's in mass, the sexual part is always urinating, liquiding all the time. Substance that is very smelly, you can hear them from the distance. They absorb, the, absorb I mean, they absorb, they really abuse the power. Sometimes even pushing trees for no reason because they're in that stage where they need to mate and they are zero tolerance with anything that might be around. In that stage, you would never ever even get so close to an elephant like these distances because he's so much aggressive. From the light, is in a, a really perfect, but you can see from the line of the eye, you can see that uh, the secret land is really liquiding. It might be something that uh, really makes this elephant. It could be heat, of course, it could be something that uh, really makes the elephant to liquid that because they don't have a sweating gland that is the only sign where the elephant overheat they can really liquid inside or use anything or urinate or tree, big trees that they can go underneath in order to protect themselves against the heat that's the reason in most cases you find an elephant preferring big canopy trees to walk within more especially in riverbed they really like that because it's a lot more cover they can able to be out and collect food for long hours than their short hours you know that the big body need to sustain if they don't eat well the big body is gonna collapse and how it's gonna collapse is just because they don't get much food and they get challenges by lions and other species that they compete even amongst themselves the competition of mating or ent entering into the period of mating you need to be healthy in order to get in that stage if you're not healthy enough you're not able to really your body send you into a mass season is where you'll be always behind you cannot be able to mate even if you reach the, that sexual maturity you cannot be able to mate if your body is not really healthy as i was estimating he's in the range of 28 25 to 28 years he can be slightly more than that you never know that is an estimation you might find that already he's been in mass in this age and he already made it you never know but uh, you can draw a line in between you cannot be so much perfect you know that the elephant once they're in mass they can stay six months in month if they don't find any partner to mate they'll cut the mass period and move and gray and able to feed themselves later stages they find that they got a partner that's really in the same period 
how they can see that because the female also once in mask they will be urinating through the sexual part the scent will be on the ground and the male will read that if he have cut his mask he will enter into period to follow up and mate although it's a competition if you're not strong enough you find all the all bigger males that are strong and more healthy come into the area they're going to mate and left you behind but if you're lucky you find that you are the only the choice of the matriarch you're going to mate very intelligent species of course they can really move in the area knowing exactly where it's water and exactly where it's water but especially if they've been in the area they know where it's healthy food and, and know where it's very poor food when it comes to nutrition. Okay, I think what I'm going to do, let's try to do the silhouette thing, because that could be really beautiful. So I'm going to drive forward, and uh, you can be quite far away from the draft. I'm hoping they don't move. Stay. Don't move. We would like to get some beautiful shots of you, something different. It's really a golden hour at the moment. It's so stunning. The way that the light is catching the grass is also next level. Okay, well, I'm just trying to see which is going to be the best. Oh, that's pretty. How's that? Is that all right? That should be that should be really lovely. Oh, my signature terrible singing angelic music because isn't that lovely? Almost a silhouette. <laughs> the camera is not quite working with us today, unfortunately. Hey. Okay. Ah, there we go. Magic, you should have, we should have, you, man, you should have said to me, one, two, three, 
that I could have done a like a click you know there's those, those people at the moment on social media that are doing that they're having like the 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 sunset or the sunrise kind of overexposed and then they snap their fingers and tilt the phone in that very moment and it miraculously looks beautiful man we could have done a TikTok live basically <laughs> should, we're gonna should we try that again should we see if it works wait I've got it let me let me climb up because I think I need to is my, you can see my head okay watch this everybody sorry we're just having a little bit of fun this afternoon so please bear with us sorry if we're annoying okay tell me what you're going to do okay i'm ready but it has to be i don't know if you understand the the thing because it's got to be overexposed okay I, I don't know the other way that you're talking about okay this is not working we'll have to discuss this when we're not live and we'll try and figure it out Eagle have to show me the video he's talking about and I'll have to show him the video that I'm talking about. But rather pretty, don't you think? Well, some of you might remember years and years ago, I had a list of things I wanted to see on quarantine because it's, it's not unlevel, but it sort of slopes and you can get quite nice silhouetted things. I'm just going to go a little bit further forward because now we've kind of lost it. So I just want to see if we can get another gap where we can try it again. I don't know if I'm going to be so lucky. I think if I pull in over here. Oh, that's quite nice. Actually, just of the head sticking out. Let's do that. Sorry. Oh, into the buffalo thorn you go. My bad. Sorry, Igor. Not sorry. <laughs> Back again? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Here's the other. Revenge continues. It wasn't just going to be a one-sort thing. I was just going to continue. Oh, whoopsie. Sorry. I didn't mean to drive you into that buffalo thorn. There we go. That's beautiful. So this is the third giraffe that I was telling you about. This is a female giraffe. And I know you've heard it time and time again, but if there is anybody that has not, you know, had much, uh, much experience with giraffe and you're wondering, Taylor, how on earth do you know that that is a female just by looking at it? It is, you saw the ossicones earlier of the males were much thicker. Also, they're apparently those two growing out to, to the right. Whereas the female's Aussie cones, those little things attached to the top of her head, uh, they are very narrow and are quite fluffy on top. I have also seen females with not, you know, very obvious fluffy tufts. But this one does. And she is feeding on an acacia species by the looks of it. Again, I'm going to use the name acacia because I'm using it as a common name. I'm not using it as a scientific name. Of course, we know they've been reclassified. Angie, yes, the giraffe are definitely camera ready. Oh, look, they've turned into two. Oh, I see what's going on over here. Okay. You've just ruined the moment. Thank you, mister. He's obviously quite keen on her, and that's why these two males are, you know, they're sussing out this female to see what she's up to. And uh, she doesn't seem too interested. I mean, you saw immediately as he approached, she went, no, thank you so much. I'm going to go and stand over here. And, uh, and do something else. Do you want me to, yeah, okay, we'll have a quick look at him again and then, oh, there's the other male. Hello? Why are you bending down towards him? That's a boy, you don't need to test his urine. Or are you feeding? Maybe he was having a nibble. Both glancing back at the, at the female as she walks away. That's a lovely shot. I feel like that's a very iconic picture of a giraffe because firstly it's silhouetted and there is a thorn tree in the foreground. They're favorite types of tree to feed on. And uh, I also really love the long eyelashes that you can see sticking out quite prominently. And of course, would a giraffe even be a giraffe without an ox pecker? So, Richard, giraffe's tongues are, are, are fairly long. Um, why do I have now have forgotten? Is it 50 centimeters in length? Or is it, yes, or is it 40 centimeters? It's a ruler and a bit. I forget if it's a ruler and two thirds of another ruler or a ruler and one third. I haven't actually spoken about how long a giraffe's tongue is for a while now. Oh, that's cool. That's amazing. They're just so graceful, but uh, it's important that their tongues are, of course, long because they... Uh, would you like me to reverse? Or are you enjoying the tricky, the trickiness today? Igor just wants to sit basically in the front seat with me. 
<laughs> this is sometimes I wish that I could also have a camera every now and then and kind of like turn it towards Igor or whoever's on camera just so you can see what they're doing and how they're maneuvering or sometimes how they're cowered in bushes you know as we try and get the perfect shot let me I'm actually going to turn around because all three of the giraffe are now on the road so let's have a look at them but it's so funny though because this is the thing I will say about anybody that's behind a camera they are the most willing people you can put them in all sorts of positions and they will get the job done which is uh, is always quite entertaining and I think I'm going to make it my uh, challenge now on how to, how to make it as uncomfortable as possible for Igor to, to fall. I'll sit obviously all nicely and out in the open and uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll see. This is actually going to be really pretty because uh, we're now moving away from silhouettes and we're going to view the giraffe in golden light. So I'm just going to just go, sneakily go around this bend a little bit just to expose the female a bit. Hi girl! We'll just sit like this for now. That is pretty. That really is pretty. You can just see all three of them. And so the female is the one on the left and the males are the ones on the right. So, you know, they haven't quite gone over and, and sort of tested or harassed her a little bit. But she looks like she's pregnant. She's got quite a round belly in comparison to what we normally see with a giraffe. You know, she's actually got a very big belly. And I think there's one giraffe on the right. I think he's actually having a scratch because I could hear some bushes moving now. So I'm not sure if he's put some trees, uh, trees between his legs. And that's actually such a cool behavior to see. But if I move, I'm absolutely going to disturb them because uh, he's quite close to the road. I don't think you're going to be able to hear the branches breaking, but that's something that we see not too often. It's not that they don't do it. Just seeing their behavior is, you know, if you've got to catch them at the right moment. But essentially they'll like move over quite a small flexible tree, put it between their legs and walk over it and hope to dislodge some of the ticks that are stuck between the folds of, uh, of the skin between their legs or even, you know, towards the nether regions. Even though they've got a long neck, they don't quite pluck ticks off of themselves. There's definitely a bit of dominance and sizing up here of the of the two individuals. And now actually now that oh no. I don't know if they're the same exactly the same size. I still feel like the lighter colored giraffe is just a little bit taller. Not that that matters. Glancing over, hoping she'll turn back and call him over. And I'm just, I'm talking complete nonsense right now because the giraffe are most certainly not saying that. Lovely. Thanks for joining me here. We are at the Gary water hole, you know that water source brings more animal. But as we can see, this water buck, it tells us nothing that might be coming around the water source. It could be if it's a leopard or lion, it might be still far from the water source, maybe later on might rock in, in the area. We have Mpala which is heading more towards the Mpala, I mean, he had quarantine away. And we look at this uh, water bug, beautiful mouth, as you can see, gray, shaky coat, and a white circle on the bum. Also on the face, you can see that he's ruminating at the moment. He's so free, happy, there's nothing to bother him. We are here to listen for any sound of any form of danger around in the area, or Impala giving us a lamb call around in the area, then we can follow up. In most cases, when you get into the area like this, you find water buck or Impala. If it's any cat, they will face in the same direction. And you can know that it could be something that comes into the water source. Wow. Second water bug coming. Look like there's an evidence that this might be something here. Yeah? The water bug are running to the left of them. So if you pan there towards uh, Mpo, you can see two water bug facing in the same direction and ahead. 
there's a lamp called a Franklin here. So that really makes these uh, guys more concerned that uh, look at the same direction that it could be something coming along the ravine. You never know. We just want to wait and see what's going to happen. If they, if whatever give us insurance, we're going to go around and look in particular at that area from the Vietella camp itself. Wow. Boy, if we pan to the left, the dead tree, you see something gray on top of the tree. Also, get interested because suddenly there's a Franklin lambing. There's a baboon, the biggest security we have in the area. We now see the baboon. One is on the ground, one is immediately go on top of the dead tree to the left of the the visual of baboon that we see right there. You can see if we pan it and zoom it on that tree itself, there's a baboon who's sitting there is booming by. It looks like something there if it's not a fox head drongo. It's the nature of the baboon. Once they feel like they are vulnerable or something, you know, Franklin, they give lamb call. And suddenly all of them, they are going up and tend to see. You know that the leopard can blend in well into the area. They can hide well. If it's not a lion, if it's not a wild dog that's chasing something, suddenly all these species, Franklin, water bug, are not happy. It could be something, maybe still hiding away from us. We need to find out by checking the area and look careful. If it's a male leopard, yes, it's going to come out. If it's a female leopard, in most cases, you might avoid the baboons and head in the direction away where you can hunt something small. Unless if there's an opportunity created by the troops of baboon, especially if there's a lot of youngster notice this lamb call from Franklin and the running of the water buck, it could be something that is there. You might uh, get a chance to hunt and more successful. But it's more dangerous for a female leopard hunting with, I mean, in the in the troops of a baboon like that it can be causing herself danger but i like because the way the water buck have responded and the baboon have responded up into the tree definitely is something it might be coming our way or, or leaving into other direction where we have to go around towards uh galaco pan as you can see the water buck the more let you can see more to the left corner or right corner of the screen there's three water buck which are are really moving away. The insurance of it, they're not going to go back the same area. They're coming towards where it's more open. That tells definitely they are thinking about something. It's not all the time that we can see the leopard or lion if it's in the area because they're hidden. They like to hide all the time. I can see through my naked eyes it quite few baboons that were sent up in the tree to look further more to the left towards where the Franklin are. There's a baboons that are going up in the trees looking direct where the lamb call was coming from. Lovely look at this uh, water buck. It's been long for me. I haven't seen water buck. Such amazing. The three miles water buck. At the moment, they're peaceful staying in the area because there's no female. Sometimes if there's a female, the one that is stronger, as we all know that survival of the fetus, when it comes to mating, is the one that is stronger than all, which is healthy, stronger, then you have preference on the female to pass on the gene pool, is how it works. You see the white circle at the bum? Many people that tease uh, water back, it seems like they sit on a wet toilet seat and uh, have that marker. That is a follow mechanism, but especially if they get threatened by anything, they can follow one another, focus on one another when running through the woodland. They can see one another and able to follow in a single fire. It's in the nature of species once they move from one part to another, but especially if they're traveling, moving, they will do that. Lovely, they're looking beautiful species. Tells, uh, I mean, fletching uh, both sides is to really get rid of uh, ticks. And also they're just waiting for the lamb call, maybe three squirrel or baboon sending an alarm call. Then they know exactly it is something. And the wind is blowing towards the direction of the north. Possible could be a leopard that comes from that direction. And 
this direction where they are, they cannot even to read, even baboon, unless if they get to spot the leopard, they cannot able to smell the leopard because they carry the smell carried by the wind in opposite direction. It's how actually lions and leopard do when it comes to hunting. They will opposite the wind in order to get close to an animal that they need to hunt, being silent and not too able to smell and they can make a kill easily. There was a lot of impala more to our left which are moving towards the quarantine. I believe the tracks that we've seen for a leopard early cause of the drive and the female in the same block where we like to go there and try to follow up because this is time now where the leopard and lions they will be active. We have great security now. If there's anything in the area, there's baboon, there's a water bug, they're all gonna give us a signal. Any years, of course, is depend with the uh, population of the water bug in the surrounding. They, they travel, more especially the female, they travel in group. Bachelor boys, they travel in group. Same as behavior of an elephant, where the bachelor boys, they form the, the bachelor boys and travel all together. And they will be uh, fighting and really put the higher rank of, high rank of all the individual. The one that is stronger is the one that always, as they travel, they come across with a female that is in estrus, you will be able to mate continuously as they move. And you find that most of the time the female will conquer or the male will conquer the female and mate the whole female on that particular area. But sometimes you find that uh, mating can last for three to four days, he will continuously move out of that area. Unless if there's two, three female that are really promising that might be in you know, oysters. Remember, the scent of the female, it carries the status of individual. It can tell that next week, Saturday, Sunday afternoon, 12 o'clock, the female she will be in oysters. A male will insist to stay there because he's in power. He's powerful, he can mate. So all that information, you will read it and know that if I, after mating, it will take two days, I'll mate with the second female. And after three, five days, there will be other two females that might be on heat, then I'm able to mate with them. So all those information will carry on. That's the reason you find bachelor boys of um, water bugs travel all together. And females are always in nature. They're social. They move together. They don't get separated. The only time that you find them separated is when the female have a youngster and he have hidden the youngster somewhere. Look at that kind of a behavior of a impala chasing one another. It shows that the male is already mating. Look at that speed. If a male is not strong enough, he's going to lose. Is how actually the female test the strong. How is the strong the male? If he's weaker, he's not able to keep up with that pace of the female. So then the new male will come and take over. So you have to exercise. It's nothing for free. You have to work hard once you're a male. The strongest of the survival, we have seen that speed of the impala male is even putting more speed and momentum to get close. Let's take this opportunity from the water bucket and impala over to Taylor. We haven't needed to move off of the open plains behind uh, the camp that we all live in because we have an elephant and uh, a young elephant bull all by himself. Not unusual to see, just munching away. Actually, what is he eating? Let me, where are my binoculars? Hmm, have I lost them? No, they're here. There they are, sorry I just misplaced them. And I want to just see what exactly he's feeding on because it's always quite interesting to sit and watch elephants And when you have a bull like this we're at a nice distance away so He's actually not bothered by us and all I mean most of the time the elephants are so relaxed anyways But we can really just observe him. He's eating grass at the moment But I thought that he would have had something particular that he's looking for and when you watch the breeding herds of elephants too It's quite uh, quite fun to you know focus on one elephant see what they're eating and you'll see that they constantly walk just searching for that one particular uh, Plant and then you'll look at another one and they're doing the same but with with a different species and um, so They must have cravings like us and I'm sure that they have some understanding between What nutrients they are they're getting from plants? I don't know if it's necessarily conscious and there's always that age-old debate about 
you know, do animals and let's, you know, you know, animals like elephants that are very intelligent, are they able to determine which plants have medicinal values? And I suppose if you look deep enough into something, you will find that all plants will have some kind of a medicinal purpose to it, but in small quantities, obviously some higher than others. But I don't know. I kind of believe it, because every time I've seen elephants with very upset stomachs, they sort of have diarrhea. I've seen them eating quarry trees. I have seen them eating silver cluster leaf. It's typically trees that are high in tannin. And um, one of the properties to tannins is that if you consume it, like for us as humans, if you eat a couple of quarry leaves, when you have a little bit of an upset stomach, it can actually help alleviate that. So I don't know if they necessarily do that consciously. I like to, of course, believe that that is the case. I'm sure that that information gets passed on. But an interesting discussion to have, however. That's obviously a difficult thing to try and prove. I'm wondering where he had a, a bit of a bath, though. It's covered in grey mud. Maybe at, uh, at Gauri Dam. The soil seems to be quite clay there. didn't even did you hear the name thinking the thinking man there we go um yes i have come across with plenty of elephants sadly with uh, defects the most common one that you'll come across throughout africa is elephants with missing parts of their trunk so they'll be missing the tip whether it's just the little uh, finger like protrusions or potentially you know even a more significant amount of the trunk and that could be from snaring um, is the most likely cause. Also, um, you can also take, you know, maybe crocodiles. Like in the Zambezi, we see a lot of animals with uh, with chomped off tails and elephants, in, for example, in Lower Zambezi or even in Zimbabwe, in Mana Pools, that section. The elephants are spending a lot of time in the water, so they are vulnerable and can lose their tails. You know, if we find elephants here on Juma, for example, with a missing tail, maybe it could be crocodiles, but it could be something else, like when they were younger, maybe a hyena or a lion or something like that happened to pull it off. Uh, or, of course, maybe the elephant was fighting and something happened. You know, there's, there's many different uh, scenarios. I have also seen... What else have I seen? Um, there's a, Actually, there's an elephant cow that has a defect that's, you know, popping up over social media for the last few years now. She's almost looking... It almost looks like she's missing a part of bone, like, I don't know, cavity, there's a big cavity in her head, basically. Maybe someone can share a photo. I don't have a photo on me to even show you. Um, and you can almost, it's exposed. It looks like you're looking into where her sinuses would be. And she seems to do very well. I know vets have looked at her and, uh, you know, treated her with antibiotics, but they, they actually think that she was born that way. Let me go forward a little bit, just because even when he pops out, we're going to run into a few more uh, difficulties. There we go. So that's quite an interesting one with a sort of birth defect. And then I saw a video of her, I think it was yesterday, or maybe today. No, it would have been yesterday. Um, of her, she was mud wallowing. And it was insane. I mean, that mud was going all the way into this cavity and she doesn't seem to get an infection or anything from it, which I think is phenomenal. So she's actually fine. She's coping quite well. Uh, I have also seen an elephant with uh, floppy trunk syndrome, which... Um, is not particularly nice to see. You can see that almost have it's almost like their trunk is completely paralyzed and they are unable to use it. So you see that happening occasionally. Mm, I'm just trying to. Uh, do you remember at Pridelands? It must have been about two and a half years ago now. We had an elephant bull. And again, if you do have some screenshots or some short clips of this, maybe you can share it with everybody. It looked like the one of the back legs of this young elephant bull was shortened, much shorter than the other legs. And he, he couldn't really walk on it, which was quite interesting. So we, we had many discussions about that, whether he was born that way, whether he broke a bone or whatever the case may be, whether he'd snapped a ligament or tendon and the leg had slightly pulled up or something along those lines. So you can indeed see, and I mean, I could go on for the next 10 years about different defects that you can see, but sadly, it is not an uncommon sight in elephants.
Here at Wild Earth, we take great pride in curating our best animal content for you. Would you like our very best animal stories, highlights, questions, and the inside scoop on all things Wild Earth before anyone else? Find it all, as well as info on our exciting plans going forward first, in the newsletter handmade just for you. Available to all Wild Earth explorers. Sun has set, still got a strong amount of ambient light still left. Probably soon after this, just uh, get onto our, our nighttime setup with IR function. For now, let's just observe these impala and enjoy them. As you know, I like to include them daily. I like to watch them. Those lambs that were all born in, in November are growing very, very quickly. You can see a whole bunch of them together there. And it's like a little school, like a nursery that. Those are all, almost all of them are lambs. Almost like a little, little school time. Talking about schools, from the 23rd to the 27th of January, while the We'll be doing a back to school theme. All right, so we are looking for schools to partake in this. So if there are any classes from schools, and this can be worldwide, that would like to join us for that first hour of the sunset safaris on every day from the 23rd to the 27th. So it will be the first hour of the sunset safari then contact us if you're a teacher or know of any teachers uh, who will be interested in something like that uh, head over to wildearth.tv slash kids to book a class on a virtual safari in Africa and there's only a certain amount of slots available so if you've not yet reached out to us hurry because it will be an incredible amount of fun almost like what these babies impalas are having at the moment also moving into the open for a reason they're going to spend the night here the grass is short not a lot of tree cover here so this is a good area for impalas to overnight they can see much better if there's a leopard approaching 
and there's not much cover for predators. So this is an overnight area for them. There is still some grass, so they can still feed, even though the grass is rather short. As we can see, they are eating, so... Also can be a very peaceful thing to do. To watch impalas like this. Very relaxing. got a bit of wind coming in as well now so it uh, brings down the temperature a little bit which I'm really grateful for because yeah it was a hot day and we're in for a hot week this is gonna be at least for another week we're gonna have heat wave conditions it's gonna be challenging it is going to be challenging and I am here for another week so Oh, it's going to be a hot one. But we're going to try and make it work. Okay, we're going to be rigging up our IR function. And while we do that, let's head over to Tyler, who's still with her elephant. I actually was leaving this elephant and then he decided he's changing direction so we could see him much better, which was nice. I said a lot, eh? Nice. Maybe you can create a list of all the words I say repetitively. It'll be a long list, that's for sure. But now, of course, as we go live, he's behind the bushes again. Why do you do this elephant? We just want to view you. And in case you were wondering, yes, he did just defecate and urinate. So you won't be seeing that uh, behavior anytime soon. I don't know why I have the luck when we want to showcase an animal and then they're just like, oh, well, no, we're not, I'm not quite sure I'm okay with that. You didn't ask for my uh, consent. And that is the smallest apple leaf tree you'll ever see in your life, but it's big enough to hide an entire elephant. You'd never know it's there. That is ridiculous. And of course now he's not even going to try and step out to the side. He's going to conceal himself and walk in a straight line away from us behind the tree so that we will never see him again. Animals really do have a sense of humor when they do things like this. And he's just peeking out, just checking over his shoulder. Nope, you're still there. And of course he's not doing that on purpose. He's just, he's feeding in circles, which is typically what elephants will do, you know. They don't always walk in one, you know, straight line. For the most part, they don't need to. Unless they're going to maybe a water hole, they, they need to be somewhere, wherever an elephant needs to be. And then you can see that sort of white gunk that's in his eye. That's a, we call it sebum. And elephants, of course, don't produce teardrops in the literal sense. So that's like, a, that's stuff that produ is produced. They all don't have tear ducts. It's like a... Um, it's got antiseptic in, it's got a whole bunch of stuff in, so you'll quite often see it uh, with, with elephants. You can imagine how much dirt and dust accumulates in their eyes. I'm sure the occasional fly that must get squashed when they blink. Because if I can do it with my little eyelids and tiny lashes, then an elephant most certainly can do the same thing. That's the most annoying feeling, trying to get something out of your eye, and you just can't get it, and they don't even have hands. You'll see them using their trunks, of course, to wipe things away. Sure, Daryl, that depends on the elephant. You know, trying to determine how heavy an elephant's trunk is is a bit tricky, like, you know, specifically. So you'd have to talk about adult elephants. I'm not actually sure. So, 
You know, when you start looking at a, an, a really big elephant bull, this is a youngster that's probably not even 20 years old yet. He's, a, you know, he looks to be of a teenager still. Um, but when you look at the elephant bulls, their trunks are enormous, you know. Like, I'm just trying to think. I've never measured the width of an elephant trunk before. But it's massive. And there's a, it's made up of muscle and uh, some cartilage. So it's going to be quite heavy. I don't know. You got any guesses how much an elephant's trunk might weigh? Like probably 100 kilograms at least. Yeah, for I reckon a really big elephant, maybe even a little bit more. But I'm not. A, I'm actually not 100% certain, Daryl. It'll be something I'll have to have to Google because obviously they can't just weigh an elephant's trunk separately. That that would have to be something that would uh, be done um, when an elephant is no longer alive. They would ha they'd have to weigh that, and then how do you determine where the trunk stops? Because it's obviously an extension of the of the face, you know, the, the nasal cavity runs all the way through. So yeah, so I'm not sure how they do that. And it, how, how often it has been done, if they have got an average of how much an elephant trunk weighs. But if you if you have the answer, perhaps they have done the study, please share it. Please let us know, send that through. And then the wonderful people in mission control will feed that information to me. So if you want to do some Googling on behalf of me, or perhaps again, you already, you already are armed with that knowledge, go for it. I will... You know, very, very uh, grateful. That's, of course, something that's quite cool on the show. You know, you don't have the answers to absolutely everything. Sometimes we can, you know, we give our opinions or we can guess. Like, I, I love trying to guess when I don't know things. Just because I don't know the answer, but let's give it a bash and let's see how close I was to it. So I would say anywhere between, for a, an adult elephant bull, between, let's go between 80 and 150 kilograms, somewhere around there. But I think that 80 kilograms is probably a bit too light, uh, to be honest. Because some of the lengths of the trunk is, uh, you know, longer than what I am tall. I don't think that makes sense either, but I'm sure you get what I'm putting down. It's actually lovely. The, the light is so diffused at the moment. It's really, really soft. And I love the, the grey highlights from the clay that is stuck to his body and his white tusks. Are they stand out quite nicely and uh, actually Tristan has a really amazing photo of an elephant I think he calls it the a, a war paint elephant or something along those lines and it's this elephant that has taken some mud that's got obviously quite a uh, high iron content because it's very sort of a rustish red in, in coloration and it's tossed it over its face and it is just so dramatic, also the way that he has edited the picture, it's just so stunning. And then, of course, something that I haven't seen, but it's on my bucket list, is to go to Namibia. And obviously you're all very lucky that you have the cameras in Okakuya, and you can sometimes see elephants. And I, I love that, you know, the, the earth, for the most part, throughout different parts in Namibia, but specifically in Natasha, the, there is a lot of clay and the, the minerals seem to be, you know, quite light in color. So when those elephants cover themselves in mud or in, you know, um, the fine dust, oh, it's so striking. It really is so beautiful. So that's somewhere I would like to go to see the giants of Namibia and all the gatherings of animals around a natural spring. But I'm glad that this elephant graced us with his presence one last time. Up. Thank you for joining us. We are the dam wall here. We're waiting for Inyala. It was freezing, not moving. But now, eventually moving to the north north uh, west direction, which seems like anything that might be here is moving away from the area. The Nyala, you can see once the Nyala intimidated with something, you can see that he's not going to move, stand still, same area. You know that uh, male Nyala can stand the fight against leopard. I believe that it could be a leopard or something small that was moving in the area. We'll follow up. The direction of Franklin maybe towards the Galagopan, that area. The baboons were all up in the trees, yeah? 
which is more like the side. I think if it's a leopard, decided it might go around and come back to the other side of quarantine. They try to follow up on that. Maybe we might be lucky. Seems like I spotted the male Nyala I'm moving to our left here. Very powerful animal. If it's anything small. Very powerful animal when it comes to defending itself. It might look like a, a medium antelope, which uh, lions and uh, I mean wild dogs and leopard can hunt them. But if they really wants to defend itself, they do. Sometimes you find this species defending itself. It needs thick bush or running inside water is where most of the damage can take place. They have a very sharp ones. You can see the tip of the horns are like uh, yellowish, very sharp in color. They used to even now and then sharpen the horns using the termite and other in this sort of or bank of a river. It's very common. It's moving here. We spotted uh, from the over other side. There was a female that crossed over here, heading in the direction because of this uh, alarm call of the of Franklin that were taking place in the area. We just hope maybe the leopard might be in the area or even further more towards the Galago pen because cannot show off here. There's a lot of uh, baboons that are taking place in the area. They might be roosting are uh, very close to the camp itself. You never know. But let's take the opportunity of driving around here towards that direction. We might be lucky and we'll be always listening what might be around in the area. Maybe it's Talamba. Could be a good day for Talamba tonight. Who knows? Oh, uh, Tavangume. You would never know. We find a Tavangume. You would never know. We find the tracks in this road heading straight direct to the north of Melbourne. And we find the tracks. We find the tracks of female leopard. There's something here to my left. I don't know what could be. Could be we still not moving now. But I can see legs moving through the thicket. It's not easy to see uh, in the area later on what you spot here. Yeah, it's a nyala. Still the male nyala. We have found like, tracks of a leopard furthermore up. Hello, Varan. Gosh, that wasn't even English. It was just a sound. Anyways, we're driving down a road, just looking for anything really. We haven't got any plans, so I think we'll just go for a little bit of a bumble and uh, see what we can find. I think I'm going to drive a road called Ingwe Alley, Leopard Alley, essentially. Not that I think I'm necessarily going to find a leopard down there, I just haven't driven it for days now. And uh, there was a point where I was only driving that road doing loops and laps around it, but uh, perhaps it's time, perhaps it's time. There's lots of mud wallows along the road, so who knows what we might, uh, what we might see. Uh, the giraffe, this is where the giraffe came from. They've come from this side and have walked up towards the plains, which are behind me. Oh, 
it's so pretty. There's lots of natal red top, which is a species of grass. It looks so lovely now. Woo! Baobab girl, you've said, thank you so much for this. You said an elephant's trunk. I'm assuming they're talking about an elephant bull here. On average weighs about 140 kilograms. I don't think my guess was that bad then. I obviously gave some leeway because I don't know, you know, the sizes of elephants that they, trunks that they were weighing. So I think that's pretty good. I was safe. I said between 80 and 150 kilograms. Yes, it was a, a big leeway. I mean, initially I'd said 100, oh, 100 and 150 kilograms, so that would have been fine too. Not terrible. So that's, I think that's a skill that all guides pick up is that we become really good at estimating things because it, you know, it's honestly, it's impossible to retain the information of gestation periods and weights and heights and 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 of every single animal species uh, and it's honestly it's not something that we necessarily talk about all the time because typically I mean we go into a lot of different conversations but typically like when you're with guests you're talking about what's going on at least unless you're you know perhaps just have a speech that you've learned about every animal and repeat that every time whatever works for you but for the most part we you know typically interpret what's going on that's how I like to train I'm like when you're sitting in a sighting or when you're watching a documentary at home you know and the animal is doing something the person that's narrating is talking about the thing that the animal's doing not something completely random I say this and I know I talk about things that are completely random but if I only spoke about what the animal was doing every single time, you'll be so bored of me because we just keep repeating ourselves every single day. So it's a bit different doing what we're doing right now. We kind of start off like that and then we go off on a tangent. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Very interesting. It's a lot of muscle. That's for sure. Can you imagine if an elephant decided it was going to just put its it's a trunk into my arms, I'd literally just collapse straight onto the ground. There's no way. However, eagle might be able to bench the weight of an elephant's trunk. <laughs> He's shaking his head at me now, going, typical. Um, yeah, goodness gracious. Okay, what are we gonna find? I got distracted for a moment. I was fixating on, hyper-focusing on something in a tree. Kenneth, I've not been in a race with an elephant before, so I'm not exactly certain how how fast every single elephant can run, but the books say that uh, they can reach between 40 and 45 kilometers an hour, and I have reversed away from a few elephants in my life, and how, should we just see, I don't know how fast we can go in reverse, should we test it out, we've got nothing, we've got nothing else to do, um, let's, let's give it a bash. Okay, are you ready? You holding on, Igor? I can't even tell you because this predominant on this car doesn't work. Let's see. Actually, I'm not, I'm gonna, I can't do it in this car. So I'll have to do it in Sparky. Next time I'm driving Sparky, we'll test it. We'll see on a, we'll do it, try and do it on like a straight road. Actually, the, the roads we've just come from on the open plains, they're quite straight, so that's quite nice. You wanna have a windy road to test the speed. But I have absolutely no idea how, uh, how fast, um, the cars can go in reverse. It'll be quite interesting. But every time I've reversed away from the elephant, I've successfully managed to to evade it and touch wood. Let's hope I keep doing that. Or, but luckily, we, we try not to get into too many situations where we need to reverse away from elephants. Thankfully, it hasn't happened to me all that often. But it's a very. I always tell. I always tell you how important of a skill it is to have to be able to to reverse. Okie dokie. I still think we should try our luck a little bit later and head back up onto the open plains and then look for the white-tailed mongoose that I've been trying to, trying to get live for the last little while now. That would be nice. Oh, so pretty. Actually, we can look here at a distance. We can uh, admire the sunset as well as a beautiful tree with a bachelier in it. And then I think we'll probably just take a moment to just sit quietly and enjoy the sounds of the bush.
You can hear all the birds starting to wind down now. You can definitely hear a white-browed scrub robin. Oh, and a very angry elephant. Wendy, you've said that there's nothing better than an African sunset. You're quite right. I haven't seen many sunsets in other parts of the world that I can say are as beautiful as the ones I've seen in Africa. But of course, this is not the case. Obviously, there are spectacular sunsets and sunrises all over the world. It just depends, of course, where you are. But luckily for us in South Africa, and especially us living in the bush, we get to have these moments every single day. I love a sunset, but however, I must admit, a sunrise. Oh, my goodness. I, uh, oh, my favorite thing at the moment is, of course, just driving out of camp and up onto the open plains behind camp. And the golden light that hits the grass is just, it's so stunning. And it's kind of like, you know, you're tired. Sometimes it's really hard waking up at four o'clock in the morning every single day. No, no guide will ever tell you that it's not. And you do it day in and day out, you know, and you sort of think, why am I doing this every day? You struggle to open your eyes. You can't find your shoes. Where's my belt? I took my belt off, but where have I put it? And you, you know, you're annoyed and then you, yeah, all those things. Maybe you don't get to have coffee and then you drive out and you're like, oh, and then you see that. Well, for me, I see that. And I'm just like, yep, now I remember. I'm just joking. I don't wake up all groggy like that. I'm actually a morning person. However, now I've yawned about 20 times and I'm quite ready for bed. I always say, I'm, I, I'm a, I should have been a farmer. Definitely should have been a farmer and just worked uh, from from sunrise to sunset. And then that's, that's me. Thank you very much. I'm, I'd be quite happy to go to bed at 7.30 in the evenings if I could. Everyone laughs at me. I'm, I think I'm really an old soul. But it is stunning. It's a magical moment. There was an elephant that was very angrily trumpeting in the distance. I don't know if there's elephants perhaps at Gauri Dam um, or, or where they are. But it wasn't very happy at all. Would you like a stay in the African bush? Open to all explorers. Sign up and stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at the fantastic Mashatu Lodge in Botswana. This bucket list prize includes daily safari drives, traditional African cuisine, spacious luxury suites, and a promise of sheer relaxation. Sign up now and stand a chance to win.
beautiful, beautiful skyline. There's one or two clouds as well. And I think we should just uh, sit back for a moment and have a, a peaceful, quiet moment and just enjoy those lovely, lovely colors. Looking forward to a week of hopefully some good sunsets since um, there's not a lot of clouds predicted with this heat wave conditions unless the high pressure system that's currently over the interior of the country dissipates and that's what's keeping the rain away currently it's preventing those weather systems from entering It will only be temporary. It will last for about a week. Hopefully what will follow then, perhaps a weather system, a cut off low or perhaps something from the Indian Ocean. That can bring us some relief because it's getting quite dry now. Good evening, Molly. And Molly is just saying how peaceful it is watching the sunset. And it is indeed very peaceful. It's calming. It's my reflection time, looking back at the day, that is has gone. Time to relive some experiences in your mind. Like those wild dogs we had this morning. That was sensational. Then we'll try and set this up every night as long as we don't have clouds or totally overcast weather. We should have some form of a skyline and a sunset. So hopefully that will that will be a daily occurrence. And this little breeze that comes in now is just bringing a little cool air, which is great.
actually hear the breeze. Billy, hi there. Question there is, what do I enjoy the most about sunsets? I love the colors. Obviously, it's it's just nice watching the colors, the skyline, the tree shapes. And then obviously the reflection, like I mentioned earlier. It's my time where I really look back at the day and relive experiences. And um, that's that's for me the time, that that's for me the real enjoyment. Other than that, I can't really put my finger on it. I think it's just something that is built into us to be able to watch the sunset. Like one of those primal instincts that's awakened when you watch a sunset like this, thinking how many people before has done that and how long ago and for how long will we be able to do that? It's a very philosophical sort of exercise for me. All right, looks like our colors is dissipating. So you get that intensifying and then it slowly as the sun goes further and further and further and fewer and fewer rays hits the atmosphere, you start to lose colors. And that's exactly what we do now. Go from here straight across though. <laughs> right, we've got the spotlight out now. Hopefully, we're going to avoid all the bugs because it's a warm evening. Actually, it's still a little bit humid. And I know we were expecting rain uh, today and tomorrow, like quite heavy rain, but it has completely vanished as, uh, it, as it does. There's a bug, found one. Rusty, you don't like first gear. You just want to be. You just, actually no, you just don't like any gears. Just choose which one. Rusty and I don't get along because I want to drive in first gear and like, you know, I like, you know, kind of drive itself a little bit in the sense that I don't want to have to keep touching the accelerator. I just want to drive slowly. Obviously, if I'm going uphill, different story. But Rusty doesn't like that. If I take my foot off the accelerator, accelerator it goes. And then just about wants to stall. Sparky's actually quite good in in first gear. In terms of the speed, it's very nice. Rusty second gear is too fast for me. I'm in second now because I don't have a choice. But I'd, I'd definitely like to be driving slower right now. We have lots of arguments. what we're going to see everything is getting tangled and then I can't use the spotlight nicely absolutely not radio go away my radio keeps creeping in like oh, I want to touch the spotlight cable no you can't there, but I've pushed it all the way back now so it shouldn't give me any more problem A little bit quiet this evening. All right, let's see what we can find in four minutes. Hopefully, something. Otherwise, it's going to be a very, very quiet last couple of minutes of the show. But we will see some spotted thick knees on the road will be quite nice. Let's go this way around and now we will be driving in first gear. I'm going to see if we can maybe find 
the white-tailed mongoose and for those of you that are not doing anything uh, tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Central African time I will be doing an ask me anything so ask me anything quite literally um, I've never done one of these before so I'm quite curious to see what the, the questions you're all going to have for me and uh, yeah maybe it's an opportunity for you to ask me some things that uh, you've always wanted to ask me before maybe I haven't replied on social media because I do get inundated with messages and I'm, I'm very sorry I try to check as many as I can but I'm also I'm terrible on social media I'm a shocker at uh, staying on top of things so you can join us for that mm -hmm. Jennifer, I'm glad that you enjoyed our afternoon and uh, you've said it's a great way to end the week. That's good. I keep forgetting that it's the weekend now. Every day is just the same. We, we, there's no difference for guides between week, weekends and, uh, and the sort of the other days, that whole Monday to Friday gig. Every day is the same. The only thing that we normally notice or have to know is the dates. But other than that, it's always the same. And even then, like when I'm not at, at work in the bush, I forget. And I just I just carry on. Because I suppose that I, I don't know, we're terrible, especially Ali and I, we just continue to work. We just work, work, work on the weekends. We always forget that we are like actually allowed to have a weekend off. <laughs> we can't help ourselves though. I always feel guilty. If I'm not doing any kind of work. Sorry, that was a yawn. I try to hide it really well. But like I said to you, the sun is now set and uh, my eyes are starting to do the same thing. <laughs> I wish I could change my body clock. Though. I wish I could, you know, jump in and program it slightly different. It was always really tricky for me when I was with guests at dinner, trying to hold back the, the fact that I was absolutely exhausted and it's like 10.30, 11 p.m., desperately using just about having to use my elbows to keep my head up which is always quite funny but anyways it has of course been a wonderful afternoon out on the sunset safari and uh, if you weren't able to catch up because perhaps you were stuck at work because it is a Friday you can of course catch all the best bits you just have to download the Explorer app and check out the highlights there but a big thank you from all of us here uh, from all the different locations we thank you for all your questions and all your comments so please remember to keep sending them in and guess what we're going to be doing this again tomorrow morning on the, the sunrise safari so make sure you set your alarms so you can have some fun with us In this episode of The Wild Show, we're going to learn about game reserve infrastructure. We'll see some cute hyenas swimming and scavenging. And then we will observe the antics of many juvenile mammals. 